on, <laughs> brothers and sisters. Welcome on in to Friday Night Live, open q and It's been a while. I did a poll. I asked you what y'all wanted. I'm going to give it a try. We're going to try as long as it's not infiltrated with narky narks. We are going to try to do open Q&A tonight. Everything breaking codependency. All right, brothers and sisters. Let's see who enters the room. It's quite early here. I just put out a couple of videos. You guys might want to go take a listen. Yesterday's videos were all about gaslighting. The seven types of gaslighting you may have never heard about that the narcissist uses, followed up by seven ways. Empaths gaslight. Two separate videos. Go check them out in the Spiritual Badass Forensics set list. And today's video, today's video that I just did profiling a female, a female sociopath. Please go check that out. I'm using the profiling tool called Statement Analysis so I can show you guys how you too can spot patterns of toxic behavior, protect yourself, and break that codependency. Speaking of which, brothers and sisters, I have a special going on right now. All my services will be listed in the description box, but my Tyrant Talking Tactics, taking the gas out of gaslighting, is half price right now. Come hit me up, Instagram a Direct Messenger. All my contact information will be in the description box along with a list of my services and come book your one-on-one -on -one for Tyrant Talking Tactics and learning to take the gas out of gaslight. And all right, especially half price. Let me get on live stream with you all, and we're going to try to do open Q&A. Hey, brothers and sisters, thanks for stopping in. Thanks for taking time out of your day. Say hello. Let me know where you are in the world. Listen, I want to just give you a couple of heads up here. Um, first of all, this channel is dedicated for forensic profiling of criminal behavior and breaking codependency between the narcissist and the love-starved empath who sometimes mirror one another in abusive types of behavior. Secondly, this channel is not for any child under the age of 18. Third of all, this is a channel absolutely not for anyone with mental disabilities. You beautiful people deserve the care and the expertise you deserve. My channel is just not the place. I'm gonna end up fucking you guys up and my stuff wouldn't even apply to you. So, um, and fourth of all, if you are a love-starved empath, this material might be disturbing to you. It might make you feel ashamed, like that toxic shame that narcissists wanna stuff down and deny and make excuses and abuses. So if at any time it makes you feel ashamed, just step away. Step away from the iPhone and uh, get your Q-tip out to quit taking it personally. This channel is not to shame you. It's to show you. All right. But I do have a very low tolerance for abuse on this channel. And I will warn you that I get a lot of predators in on this channel. And the majority of the subscribers I do feel are borderline narcissists or narcissists themselves or psychopaths and sociopaths. I'd say less than 5% are truly empathic codependent. So we do get a lot of abuse here. And, um, you know, I call shit out. And uh, I, I just ask you if you're going to ask a question or um, talk about anything vulnerable, brothers and sisters, just be aware there's predators here that are coming to fish for you. So maybe ask your question or tell us your vulnerable stuff, but then immediately redact it. Get rid of it. Delete it. All right, just to keep yourself safe. All right, so let's get it started. If you guys have questions, all I ask is you type them in capital letters because my 58-year-old eyes <laughs> need capital letters. Um, and Wolf Brightstone, I have had somebody tell me who to be, what to speak, how to speak, how to act, what to think, what to feel, for 52 goddamn years, if I'm going to fucking swear, I'm going to fucking swear. If you don't like it, swipe the fuck away. Don't ever tell somebody what you think is best for them. I know myself best. Thank you the fuck much. Got it? All right. So that's a good start. We already got a 
we've already got somebody looking to, you know, narcissistically abuse a woman. Tell me what to do. Perfect stranger. Couple of narky narcs in here. Man boy incels who obviously can't get a woman in real life. And they come in to, to just try to bully a woman because that's who they are. Pathetic. Three of them. Three of them in a row. All right, we'll give it a try. We'll give it a try. Three of them gone. Like goddamn bowling pins. Strike. Strike two. Oh, baseball. Strike three, you're out. We use a three-strike rule I teach you in tyrant talking tactics. People come in to degrade you. You don't put up with that, brothers and sisters. You immediately block them or you tell them, this is not tolerated here. I don't have the patience for that. Clearly, they should know. It's not tolerated here, but the man boys don't like strong women. They've always got something to complain about. All right, let's see if anybody asks questions. You didn't want tarot, so I'd love to do tarot, but you guys don't want the tarot? Give the open Q&A. Let's give it a try. Can ask questions about codependency, behavior, healing, how to heal codependency, how to break the codependency, tyrant talking tactics, whatever you want, as long as it's not medical questions. And as long as you know, this channel, is, I should have mentioned, is not a substitute for professional help. This not is not a substitute for legal advice. This is a channel just basically to entertain. Tarot, please, for Aquarius. Jip, they asked me to do open Q&A today, brother. I'm not going to do tarot. I'm doing what the audience has asked for. They asked for open questions today. So I'm giving it a try. Sorry about that, Jip. I love to do tarot, man. I love it, but they didn't want it. I did a poll today. They wanted the open Q&A instead. We'll give it a try. Tarot for Aquarius. I can give you your astrology. You want your astro drop down, Jip? How about that? How about I give you an astro for Aquarius? Well, you know, brother, um, a lot going on astrologically. It's New Year's, right? It's airy season as of yesterday. Happy New Year to everybody. Happy airy season to everybody. Happy spring equinox. Happy vernal equinox. We have, we're also in a leap year, right? We've been in a leap year, but um, we have the, Prenumbral lunar eclipse coming up on the 25th. Mars moves into Pisces, I think, tomorrow. Um, the prenumbral lunar eclipse is in the south node of Libra. We got Mars ingressing into Aries on April 1st, April Fool's Day. I mean, that's a big, big bunch of stuff already, right? Then we got Venus conjuncting fucking Saturn in Pisces. With Neptune there, Neptune the ruler of Pisces, Mars ingressing into Pisces on April Fool's Day after the prenumbral lunar eclipse. Then we're going into a solar eclipse, a full solar eclipse on April 8th in the north node of Aries. So we've got the stellium of Aries and Chiron with the sun and Mars. And then we'll have the stellium of Venus, Saturn, and Neptune in Pisces. What does this all mean for you, shiny aqua alien nerd? Jip Atkinson? Let me tell you, the eclipses are going to hit you in your ninth house south node and your third house north node. So eclipses are a very ominous thing, Brother Jip. Correct me if I'm wrong, if you're not a brother, all right? Correct your pronouns as we go along. So the prenumbral lunar will be in your ninth house and the full solar will be in your third house. And eclipses are not only ominous, I mean, they're omens, right? The Babylonians used to stay indoors and fast and pray for three days. Oh, a sister, thanks for letting me know, girl. You know, they fast and stay indoors for three days, and they don't go out in it because it kind of marks you as an omen of sometimes death, death of a king, um, you know, a shift of power. Um, eclipses bring famine, um, war, sickness, plagues, and death. It's considered an omen. So it's hitting you in your third house north node with Chiron, Mars, and the sun. And the prenumbral 
in the south noding in ninth house, which is the dispositor of Venus, and the north node, the dispositor of Mars. This is heavy, heavy for you. So it's going to cut out a lot of things in your local life, Aqua. It's going to cut out a lot of things that maybe aren't of truth or, or maybe bring you to bring you out of your beliefs into more of a solid truth. Um, it could be a lot of things, you know, could even be like cutting you off from a trip, cutting you off from a school, cutting you off from a teacher, cutting you, cutting your car down so you can't travel around your community. I mean, it's hitting you in what I call the kitchen sink drawer of your third house. And then the ninth house, which is, you know, the house of travel and learning and belief and coming to the realization of you know what what is the thing you're lacking in education lacking in wisdom so for you shiny aqua alien nerd especially with saturn let me do your let me see what saturn's been <laughs> doing here for you saturn and okay okay that's why saturn and venus conjuncting in your fourth house i mean you're probably emotional as fuck but the thing is jip you shiny aqua alien nerds, you laugh your emotions off. I would love to see a shiny aqua alien nerd stop being an alien, get out of the spaceship, come sit on the couch with me and chitty chat. I'd love to see an Aquarius cry or, or do more than tell a joke or try to be stoic. I'd love to hear a alien be more human with emotion. So Venus conjuncting Saturn is saying, hey, you know what, relationally, worth-wise, value-wise, Saturn is telling you in time, you know, you're not being emotional enough or you're not sharing your emotions enough. Saturn's conjuncting and saying, it's about time, nerd, that you share your emotions, that you sit down with maybe some ninth house, you know, wisdom teacher, and talk about your vulnerable pain. Stop laughing it away. Stop singing it away. Stop dancing it away. You know, you Aquariuses are funny as fuck. You're some of the best singers. You're the quirkiest singers. You're super talented. But you don't get real. You don't get real human. You're so cold and detached in sharing this emotion of yours. You're super protective. But Venus conjunct Saturn is like, mm, you know what, it's time. It's time you share your value. The value of a human is being emotional. The value of a human is more than just being logical Aquarian. I love the logical Aquarians because they're smart as fuck, right? But we need a little bit more than, than your logic, your intelligence, your funniness, your, your great voice of singing and your awesome fucking dance moves we need some emotional healing in you now and maybe you need to hire a coach jip maybe you need to hire a coach or get an astrology reading from this gal i love to do astrology readings mine are several hours long and an eighth of the price of a professional astrologer who will charge you twelve hundred dollar dollars for a half hour mine are three hundred and thirty three for about five hours, all different kinds of charts. So I would sit down and say, maybe I need some education on my emotions. Maybe I need to learn how to regulate these emotions that I stuff down, that I don't show the world because I put on this alien mask and I mask my hurt, I mask my pain, I mask my problems, I'll tell a joke instead. I'll do a dancing jig instead. So I hope that helps you. Yeah, you guys do compartmentalize. I get it. I'm an Aquarian moon. I totally get it. But I'm also a sloppy, emotional as fuck person. I'm just very careful who I will and will not share those beautiful, delicious, delectable emotions. So I hope that helps, Aquarius son, sister. Virgo female narcissist. I'm not going to do if she's cheating on you. Harem, if you suspect somebody's cheating on you, there's your answer. Don't consult tarot cards for that. Go talk to that person. Confront them and say, I suspect you're cheating. I suspect you're cheating because here's my evidence. Don't accuse somebody of cheating without evidence. Don't do it on feeling. Confront them. 
If something don't feel right, it's wrong. If they're not answering or they're telling you you're crazy or, you know, ignoring the subject, you already know the answer. You're on a stranger's channel asking if somebody's cheating. Come on, man. Oh, no. I'd say if they're a Virgo right now, Virgos are in damn good shape. The Virgos are fucking kicking ass right now. This is their year to get their shit together. I wouldn't fuck with a Virgo this year. They're fucking stoic. But, uh, you know, I'm not here to answer those kind of questions. I don't want to answer desperate questions. Hear them? Come on, you deserve better than that desperate question. Ask me anything meaning anything about breaking codependency. Nikki, come on, I just bitch smacked poor Hiram about his stupid ass question that is so desperate. I'm here to answer questions on breaking codependency. I appreciate you too, Hiram. And listen, I'm assuming brother, brother, Hiram, Whitaker, listen, if you're feeling like your Virgo's cheating, that might already be your answer. They probably have been showing you all these signs. Coming home late, making excuses, hanging out with BFF all the time, on the phone in the bathroom, on the phone in the driveway, not letting you see their phone. You know, you already got the signs, hero. You got it. Repent from this demonic activity and follow the Lord Jesus, says Tian Stein. We're talking about breaking codependency. Apparently... T and Stein is infiltrated with demons. And as you guys know, as a forensic profiler, somebody that talks like T-I-A-A-N, capital S-T-Y-N, that's our biggest red flag in forensic profiling. That shows us somebody who says, repent from this demonic activity and follow the Lord Jesus is somebody who's a dangerous person. They will not ever be open-minded. They will constantly punish you. They will not see or allow you to have your own views. They will damnate you. They will send you to hell. And they will believe that it's under the guise of God's goodness, which to a profiler is fucking sick in the fucking head. If you ever see somebody talk like Tian Stein, block their ass. They're pathetic. They're some of the most vile people. And they commit some of the most egregious crimes against children and women. Let's get rid of that fool. We do end up using the live stream as perfect opportunities as these narcissists come in. They're pretty obvious tonight, though, it looks like. And I get three types on this channel, brothers and sisters. I get the Jesus thumper, just like we saw in Tium. I get the man boy incel, like we saw in the first three guys. And I get the borderline female fixated on their favorite person, a.k.a. me. And if it's not me, oh, they're going to be fixated on you in the live stream. Those three types flood this channel. You guys deserve better than that. Aren't we done with these abusers? I know I am. Oh, my goodness. Hiram, do you know you deserve better than you think somebody's cheating on you? Even if you suspect somebody's cheating on you, brother, you deserve better than even thinking somebody's cheating on you. Hope you know that. Hope you know you deserve better. I recently broke up with a boyfriend who I'd been dating almost six months because his ex-girlfriend found me. And he wasn't so happy that I was going to have a little sit-down chitty chat with her. I told him if there was anything, there's nothing to hide, right? But she had told me he's a serial cheater. And after my conversation with her was over, I went to him and I tried to sit and talk to him. And he just kept saying, she's just crazy. She's crazy. Don't listen to her. He wouldn't address any of the issues. So I had to break up with him. You're welcome, Hiram. You deserve better. Sometimes it's hard to admit, like... I know we think we like or love or care about this person, but somebody that should care about us would never go behind our backs or lie to us or make excuses or bring a third party in. They'd have enough dignity and respect to care about you enough to say, I have eyes for somebody else. You deserve better. I think we should break up. I think codependence was a bit like hypnotism in my past, 
says Jip. Ain't that the truth? When we come out of these abusive relationships, it's almost like I used to compare it to a lead blanket. I used to tell the school I was in or my therapist or certain doctors at the time six years ago, five and four years ago even, it was like taking this lead blanket off of my whole existence and I was finally living in the reality I choose for myself without somebody trying to stop me or talk me out of me. It is like hypnotism. And did you know, Jip, the entrainment cycle of an abuser, idealization, devaluation, discard and hoover, the entrainment cycle, and it goes on for years. That entrainment cycle, we call it music theory. Music theory is when you get entrained so well, you're now breathing in synchronicity with the narcissist. Your brain waves are in musical theory, identical theory with the narcissist. You're entrained, you're hypnotized with the narcissist in musical theory. Your brain waves are synced with an abuser. So it is like being hypnotized. Great analogy. Great analogy, Jip. Yes, that's what it felt like, taking this blanket off of. It's, it still feels like that for me, because I was just telling a, a girlfriend, she invited me over for coffee and croissants this morning. <laughs> and uh, I was telling her about this junk food restaurant called Taco Bell. And she thought it was weird that, you know, I find it so delicious, but this is my first six years away from all kinds of biological psychopathic family members and psychopathic ex-husbands and their families. And I get to try Taco Bell. I've never been allowed to eat junk food ever. So to me, even though it's a strange thing for her, it's like taking the lead blanket off. Like, oh my God, this fucking Cordia thing is like fucking crack. It's fucking awesome. So it is like removing a lead blanket or being out of the hypnotism. Just remember, brothers and sisters, entrainment forces you into musical theory. You're actually, your heart's beating in the same rhythm as the narcissist. Your brain waves are, beat, are, are in the same wavelength. Even when you walk side by side, your, your walking gait will be the same. So it's called music theory. You are hypnotized for sure. That's why it's hard to break this stuff when you come out. That's why your brain is just constantly going around in circles thinking about the ex. Or poor Hiram is probably thinking all the time, if they, is she cheating on me? Is she cheating on me? I think she's cheating on me. She must be cheating on me. Oh, she came home late. She gave me that weak excuse. Oh my God, she's in the bathroom with her phone again. Oh, she's, she said she was going there. Why would she be going there? Your whole brain is rhythmically induced in, in hypnosis, music theory feels weird, right? When you come out, it feels weird. It feels weird to even know what your rights are when you come out of abuse because you're so hypnotized. Did you guys watch the video, Your Rights Are Not Wrong? You guys might want to take a listen to that because you are hypnotized out of your rights. You are hypnotized out of what your rights are to speak boundaries, what your rights are to make decisions, what your rights are to feel, what your rights are to express. You're hypnotized out of that. Go check out that video. It's called Your Rights Are Not Wrong. And uh, write them down and put them up on your refrigerator. And every day you go over your rights and know that they're not wrong. It'll take you entrainment of healthy to get out of the entrainment of music theory, psychopathy. I remember those days, hear them. I remember them well. <laughs> I got the same excuses by ex-psychopath too. And all the denial he did about the girl in the relationship turned out to be everything I was accusing him of anyway. It was, and it was the girl I knew it was. And all the lies, all the excuses, that I, I knew. You do too, brother. <laughs> all right, anybody got questions? I'll love to do your astrology. I'll do if you guys want me to do tarot. I'll do tarot. What do you want? What you want? It's your Friday night. It's your Friday night. I had a good old fucking southern chicken dinner tonight, made by my southern 
gal pal. Fried chicken, potato salad. Leo, Leo, here I'm your Leo. I'm a Leo in Vedic. All right, Leo. Eclipse are gonna hit you just like Aquarius. Remember, I just gave Jip, Jip his her, her astrology. Well, Leo and Aquarius are on the opposite polarity. It's called the axis. Leo and Aquarius are, are polar opposites. You're on the axis of what I just told Jip. You're on the ninth house, though, north node, third house, south node. You are going to have eclipses of maybe a computer breaking down, your car breaking down, traffic jams, motherfucker. You know, crazy accidents on the highway, um, crowded spaces that you didn't expect. Um, it could be a sudden, you know, realization like, oh my God, this is no longer a belief anymore. I've got to store that away and... And now I've got the fact of the matter. I might need to hire a ninth house north node or like your sister Jojo. She's got a ninth house north node. She might be a good ninth house person to work with. I might need to contact her. Eclipse energy are going to work with cutting out stuff that isn't necessary. It could be like, um, you know, maybe a, if you're in university or something or call, what you call college in America, uni in uh, in London or Australia, you know, it might be like cutting out a class at university. It might be like cutting out, you know, different types of religious beliefs, different types of practices, maybe cutting out um, the trip over to the ashram in India because, you know, things are getting real crazy on those Boeings and 747s in the sky that don't seem to be staying in the sky lately, which I predicted in 2019 and 2020, by the way. Leo also, I don't know, oh, you're with, is that person living with you, Hiram? Hiram, is she living with you, the Virgo? Because if she is, she's cheating on you because you're all eighth house, brother. Um, Sun, Saturn, Neptune, Mars right now until Mars moves into Aries is in your eighth house. That's the house of cheating, motherfucker. That's the house of cheating. And, um... Let me just see something here, too. Let me just see something else here. You might be financing her. She might be money hungry, gold digger. She's living in the house with you. She could be, oh, Le Leo, or Leo, hear him, Leo. You need to go watch, well, you don't need to. I would recommend, sorry, I didn't mean to order you. I would recommend you go listen to 19 Shocking Secrets. The narcissist does during devaluation. 19 shocking secrets of narcissist devaluation. I guarantee because the sun, excuse me, because Venus, Saturn, Neptune, and Mars currently are in Pisces. That's in your eighth house. That's the house of cheating. That's the house of penny pinching. That's the house of secretly videotaping your SEX sessions. And then Virgo leaves your Leo ass and does revenge, P-O-R-N, on some kind of OnlyFans site or some other creepy shit. So, Leo, the eighth house. Also, if you're married to her, do expect a divorce. If you're not married to her, do expect a breakup. Hopefully, you break up first because you know, Hiram, you deserve better. Leos deserve better. I'm a loudmouth Leo. Leo, if I suspect somebody's a cheating in my life, I don't care how sexy my ex-boyfriend was. He was fucking sexy as fuck. Strong as fuck. He loved all the same things as me. Guns and knives and fast cars and badass trucks. And man, I had so much fun with him. I'm going to miss him. But man, I deserve better than a fucking cheater. 24 years. I'm sorry, brother. I was 22 years with my psychopath. You deserve better. If I can help you in any way... You know, you're going to have to break up with this person and it can be court of law, seventh house, where Pluto Aquarius is till 2043, Leo. That's the house of disruption. That's the house of breakups. That's the house of Saturn, the court. Order in the court, Aquarius, to separate, to disconnect, to break up. And Jupiter Uranus in your 10th house, she's going to try to take your power away, brother. She's going to try to take you down and emasculate you. She's going to call you out as some kind of... She could even call you out as a S-E-X predator. 
come work with a badass like myself so I can profile her ass and we can get her caught. You deserve better than that, Leo. Hear him. Hope that helped you. Opposite of Aquarius. And if Aqua, Jib, if you're still here, I gave you your wrong house of Venus, Saturn. You're actually in the second house where Leo's in the eighth. So pretty much you guys need to get some stability. Stability over the crises in action in your house. Oh, okay, Jip, good. Um, you know, because this is financially could crush you guys. Financially crush you to destitution through, you know, other people's manipulation tactics. After the abuse, is it possible to get your identity back or do you have to recreate yourself? Feels like a part of me was stolen. Christy, that's an excellent question. To be quite honest, Christy, you don't have an identity. You didn't ever have one. You tried to have one. So here's the thing. In your formative years, in between the ages of toddler to eight-year-old and then adolescence, you have to separate from mommy and individuate a total of three times. The codependent narcissist will never be able to separate not once, twice, or three times from mommy. They're constantly connected to mommy in this um, attachment that is, is a despisement to them. The codependent empath has separated and individuated in their toddler years, maybe 18 months old. Maybe by the time they're seven or eight, but they're missing the third process in their adolescence. They've never grown into a full identity. They have pieces of who they've tried to be. But because you've been around codependent narcissists and love-starved enablers, you have been crushed of a real identity. So it's not like recreating yourself, Christy. It's like becoming yourself. It's like becoming the person they never wanted you to be. Becoming this person they always talked you out of being. Becoming and doing the things you've always wanted to do, but were maybe shamed for. So there's no recreating anything. You're missing the third process. Some are missing the second and third. Most are just missing the third to become an independent individual, completely detached from mommy to be independent and interpersonal. It's not a recreation. We want to throw all that stuff away. We're raised by people who told us who to be. You want to become who you've always wanted to be, but we're told not to. Does that help? Did that make sense? It feels really weird. It feels really weird because I was only allowed to be a soft-spoken, very polite, eloquent Virgo. I was never allowed to swear, never allowed to crack a good joke, never allowed to rhyme, never allowed to fucking, you know, be loud. Never allowed to wear baseball caps and fucking fun clothes. I, I had to really learn to become who I've always wanted to be. Um, who these people never wanted me to be. And when I looked at my own astrological natal chart, I was like, oh my God. No wonder they wanted to shut my fucking voice down. No wonder they hated my truth. No wonder they tried to kill me. No wonder they told me that was a weakness. These are all my strengths. Um, so, you know, no, and everything that I love, they talked me out of being or doing. So when you're starting to become, it feels really weird and you feel insecure trying your real identity on and you feel weird as fuck. It feels like you don't have a right to become who you want to be, who you're supposed to be, who you're dying to be. And then once you become it, you're like, oh my God, this feels so good. I'm finally me. And now anybody can try to attack me, humiliate me, abuse me, blame me, fucking gaslight me, manipulate me. It doesn't fucking phase me. I'm independent. Codependent no more. Hey, says Candace, I think. Let me get my glasses. Oh my God, that makes total sense. Thank you. You're welcome, girl. Thank you for the awesome question. That was a badass question. Carson Lee, hey. Hey, back to you. Aberration. Aberration comes in and just says married? Question mark. I want everybody to look at this person, this guy, 
aberration just comes in and says married question mark all right so clearly this is somebody with no social efficacy because usually with someone with respect is going to say hi you know it's nice to meet you I really you know kind of like what you're saying by the way are you married now we're going to teach you here on my channel never answer a person like that who just seems so entitled that they can't even formulate a respectful sentence let alone a socially inept sentence married question mark you think i'm going to answer that no don't answer people like that brothers and sisters pumpkin sylvester hi i'm 60 until still trying to find a life well are you do you have coaches do you have counselors? Do you have a therapist? Do you have a doctor? What have you been doing? Why are you still trying to find a life? Are you working with people to help you help you find it? Help you find yourself so you can find the life that you've always wanted to live? Golden chicken nugget. No, I don't do that golden chicken nugget. Sorry, I don't do shout outs because somebody ruined it for everybody, brother, sister, brother. All right, Pumpkin, I don't do bipolar here on this channel. I'm sorry. I, 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 I repeat myself over and over. My material is not going to help anybody with mental illness. You need to find a channel that specializes in that. I'm not your gal. My stuff's going to fuck you up. All right, you need, there's 131 million, there's 131.8 million YouTube channels for you to go find about bipolar. This one's not it. My stuff's going to fuck you up. My stuff is not going to apply to you. I'm going to have to wish you well, and I'm going to have to block you. I specialize in codependency with no comorbidities. Your comorbidities are for you to talk to your doctor, your therapist, your counselor, your coaches, and other YouTube channels that specialize in that for you. I'm sorry, golden chicken nugget. I'm sorry. You know how they say one bad apple spoils the whole bunch? That's why. I don't, I, because I, you know, somebody is always suckering me into just doing a hello or a happy birthday. And I always get suckered in only to be betrayed. So, unfortunately, I can't. I'm sorry. Your therapist sucks, says Blaze It 505 Okay, Blaze It 505, how long you been with that therapist? Let's talk about this. Blaze, how long? We have a lot of sucky therapists out there, right? A lot of them. I call them the Dr. Freuds, right? If we take the, the diction word of therapist, T-H-E-R-A-P-I-S-T, the therapists do suck, right? How long you been with this therapist? The T-H-E-R-I-P-S-T. I just, about a year now. She's technically a social worker. Okay, that's not a therapist. That's a social worker then. Unless they're a licensed clinical social worker who's allowed to have the term therapist after her name. Now, the reason I asked Blaze505 how long is because a lot of times codependents will stay in dynamics that aren't conducive, aren't helpful, aren't moving them ahead. They stay in it because they've, they've got this sense of codependent learned helplessness. So if you're in there longer than three months, Blaze, something's saying, wait a minute, something's not right here. This social worker isn't allowing me to... You know, I'm not growing the way I should. Why am I staying a whole year with somebody who's really not helping me? It's because you're in learned helplessness by no fault of your own. And you haven't learned to think logically. You haven't learned to think, oh my God, I've put myself in this for over a year. About a year now. And this isn't conducive. My therapist sucks. I need to think logical now. I need to find a real therapist or a real social worker that's licensed clinical therapist. They'll have letters after their name. All it's doing for me at this point is getting me out of the house, but that's not a, that's a codependent excuse, right? So I want to teach you how to get out of codependent learned helplessness. 
First of all, that's not a good reason to get out of the house. You can get out of the house anytime and go take a couple, you know, walk, half a mile walk, you know, walk down, you know, to the park, go swing on the swings. There's other ways to get out of the house. You can go to the store, get groceries. You can get out and go join a walking group. You can go join an art class. You can go join, no, no, a gym, a yoga class, whatever. You can get out of the house in other ways. Let's think logical. Codependents think learned helpless and will give me these irrational excuses, right? That's an irrational excuse. Newbie, I'm going to do what the fuck I choose for my fucking self, bro. Got it? Got it, bitch? Newbie doesn't like, newbie's demanding I stop smoking. He's calling me bro and man, telling me smoking is unhealthy, not like walking. Newbie, you can fuck off. I'm going to do what I want. Now let's get back to Blaze. Blaze, think about it. You can get out of the house in many other ways. So codependents make these irrational excuses. When you tell an excuse to me, so I'm a healthy, logical, independent person. It's not that I don't slip back into codependency sometimes. I just catch myself faster. But independent, healthy people, when we hear an excuse, well, all it's doing is getting me out of the house. It sounds illogical to us because you're emotionally thinking. You're not logically or rationally thinking. You're emotionally thinking and your excuses sound really ridiculous to healthy people. By no fault of your own. By no fault of your own. Okay, Blaze, so you know. Um, I'm sure you get a lot out of those 12-step programs too, Brother Blaze, but I also teach on this channel, do not befriend any of those people. The majority of people in those groups are, are predator, predatorial, um, untrustable crustables, and a lot of them, most of them, will be borderline flavor and narcissistic flavor, a couple of psychopaths in the mix, but... Yeah, I teach you how to break all that kind of stuff because alcoholism and drug abuse is based on codependency. So, um, you know, you can, I mean, I'm glad that's helping you, but a lot of people end up using AA as a crutch, right? They'll go to AA every night, every day. They need a meeting. Oh my God, they see a drink. They need a meeting. Come on, brother. That's not healing alcoholism either, right? Why don't these programs work? Because it's all based on codependency. So you really need a talk counselor, somebody who's a trauma-informed therapist, whether that's a child abuse therapist, a trauma-informed therapist, somebody that specializes in attachment theory, somebody that specializes in psychopathy abuse, psychopathic narcissistic abuse. We need to get out of this learned helplessness and this emotional reasoning to logical, healthy people sounds ridiculous. You deserve better. Why do the narcs contact you even after years and they talk as though nothing happened? Okay, number one, because your no contact is not in found, is, is breachable. Because you have not gone full no contact. You have not made it impossible for them to contact you. People who tell me, you know, this person has contacted you years later, it's because you have the same phone number, you have the same email, you have the same social media. You never really went no contact because in the back of your subconscious mind, you want them to contact you. Now, the second part of your question, and they talk as though nothing happened because a narcissist actually rewrites reality. After a certain space and time is, is over, they actually rewrite the reality. It's called confabulation. They confabulate a new reality and they believe it. So you and I would think they're lying or, you know, just um, randomly forget that they've abused us, but they have learned to lie as their nature, learned to confabulate as their nature, reality rewriting as their nature, confabulation as their nature. So by the time they find you again, they really believe nothing happening. If it did, you should be over it. After all, you should be glad to hear from them. They believe themselves. So the two part question, your no contact sucks, jib. Enforce your no contact. And secondly, because narcissists confabulate naturally in their brain. 
That's why we get so frustrated with them where we think, we, we actually accuse them. You're just downright lying. You know you're lying. They've rewritten the reality and their brain is so vastly different than ours. It confabulates and believes the confabulation. That's why they fight us. You know how um, codependent empaths and healthy people are intolerant to gaslighting? Well, just think of it that narcissists are tolerant to their own gaslighting. They believe their own gaslighting. Where we're intolerant to it, we don't believe it. Good question. That was a good one. A couple of good questions here, brothers and sisters. A couple of great questions. Anybody else? Yeah, I had to learn a lot about confabulation. It was a fascinating thing to learn. I had to hire a bunch of different experts to learn about confabulations. I ended up working with a psychopath for a while. He's probably the greatest asset I ever hired. I spent a fortune with him, but everything I learned from him was incredible. Probably where the, one of the reasons why I'm at where I'm at today. He broke through a lot of misconceptions I had because I think so different. You and I think so vastly different than these people. Our brains physiologically are so vastly different. Hard to understand. We'll never understand their brains because we'll never have a brain like that. Although I have learned recently that there are certain types of head trauma that can cause a codependent empathic person to stop being empathic which was pretty fucking frightening. Fucking frightening as fuck. Um, they tend to, they end up, people with head trauma end up being some of the worst criminals we deal with. Um, or, or, you know, they'll end up being like a Muhammad Ali or some of those football players you hear fucking these atrocious stories about. So, yeah, anybody else? Thanks for joining tonight, brothers and sisters. Really great to see you. Any questions about new supply? Defending yourself during a smear campaign? Tyrant talking tactics? Healing? The modalities involved in regulating your emotions? Anything like that? Hey, and by the way, brothers and sisters, my Tyrant Talking Tactic classes are half price right now. Come book your one-on-one -on -one Instagram direct messenger to learn how to take the gas out of gas lane to stop talking codependently. Do me a favor, too. Is Hulk smash the like button if you like what I'm doing. All right, no questions. I guess I'll break out the cards. I'll see where, where this goes. I blocked in the end. Blocking's not enough, Jip. No contact. When I teach no contact, I learned from a psychopath. I learned no contact from a psychopath. Blocking is not enough. You have to change your number. If you can, change your phone, change your computers. Get rid of all your electronic devices, including your fucking TVs. Change all your passwords to all your accounts, including your Netflix and your Amazon and everything else in the godforsaken planet. Fucking close your goddamn email down. Get a new email. Fucking, um, you know, ch get off social media. J shut all your social media down and open new ones up six to eight months later. Blocking is not enough, brother. Blocking will do nothing. These people will always worm a way back in if they can. And we have to be responsible with our lives that we know we deserve better than having that. If you want to inflict permanent narcissistic injury on somebody, you fucking go no contact the right way. Where they can never have at you ever again. They'll never get your love. They'll never get your support. They'll never get your respect. They'll never get your dollar dollars. They'll never get your little toys you buy them. They'll never get your sexy juiciness. They'll never even know what's going on in your life because they don't deserve to know. They are beneath you. And I know name changes to it for 
certain women. Yes, we've talked about that too. I, my name's changed, so I changed my name too. So we do everything. Blocking is not enough, girl. Even changing emails, you guys think it's going to be devastating or changing banking accounts or getting, you know, second or third party authentication, changing all your passwords. You think it's going to be a tedious process. It's not. You can just take your time. One day you do a little bit, the next day a little bit more, you know, take a couple of weeks. By the time you realize it, it's, it's much easier than you ever thought it was going to be. And I teach you everything how to do it. I even teach you how to reroute your old email and your old phone number through state attorney's offices. So everything gets, even your mail, your, your snail mail, get routed through certain agencies. So it has a tracking method before it comes back to you. I teach what I teach for a reason because I catch these motherfuckers for a living, <laughs> brothers and sisters. I love my job. Name change, though. The unfortunate thing about the name change is you have to advertise it in a, a publication, a written publication that is, what do they call that? Where it's just uh, delivered out to people. I forget, the, I forget words sometimes with the brain injury from the coma. Circulated. You have to have it published in a paper that's circulated through the communities you've lived in. That's the only downfall about it. But I even have ways around that if you want to change your name because I'll never let these people, my biological family and the ex, ever know my name change. Speaking of short change, this is Page Pentacles. This is short changing ourselves all right. What's the deal with the brain fog? Is that done intentionally or is it a byproduct of the relationship? That was true craziness. Excellent question again, Christy. The brain fog is actually caused by brain damage. So I don't care what anybody will tell you and no narcissistic abuse coach channel is ever going to tell you the truth about this. If you've been with a narcissist longer than 21 days, anybody who's been in long-term relationships, even relationships two, three years you have more than brain fog. You have brain damage. Now, it's temporary. It's different than my brain injury. My brain injury is from a coma. The brain fog is actual brain damage from all of the cognitive distortions, from all of the gaslighting, from all of the psychological manipulation. There's seven different types of method of gaslighting. All of those methods upon the human brain causes a codependent and a healthy person such immeasurable dysfunction, confusion. But if it's entrained in us, it then starts to gather into a damaged area of our brain until we separate from these relationships, get the cognitive behavioral therapy, the DBT or CBT therapy, which is cognitive or dialectical behavioral therapy, um, modalities, brain, um, brain hemisphere modalities, all of these other things, we can cure the brain damage. It's because we've lived, we've been living in the amygdala, the brain stem, for so long that our frontal lobe is just all jacked up and damaged. And, you know, depending on how long you've been in the relationship, it takes a while for that to heal. You know, you've been psychologically manipulated for over and over and over for God knows how many years. Brain fog is the the minor kind word for brain damage, brain damage. It's brain damaging. Like we could prove it on a PET scan. It's brain damaging from gaslighting, girl. All the gaslighting and the little bits of the tidbits of love and then they pull away and go silent. Oh, we're gonna talk to you again. They pull away or they try to blame shift you. They try to, you know, it's, it's, it's a thing that over time, over it takes 21 days, 21 days to develop a new habit, brain fog in this case. If you're anything like the Leo in the house, Hiram, he was in the relationship for 24 years. I was in it for 22, plus raised, raised by a dysfunctional family, like 52 years. Oh, jacked up six years ago. 
2.5 decades. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of brain damage. And brothers and sisters, don't let that scare you. The brain has something called neuroplasticity. It's badass. Your brain is so strong. Your brain can heal. Your brain can function logically again. Your brain doesn't have to live in that damage or fog. Um, but, you know, you need to be fair to yourself. And you need to value yourself that you deserve to hire help. You deserve to get well. You deserve to break the brain damage. The brain damage. It's more than a byproduct, honey. You've probably been raised with the... I mean, I know I was in such damage of my mind. You know, this is where a lot of us get so misdiagnosed by psychologists or psychiatrists or even physicians because of the brain damage from the cognitive, psychological manipulation. So it can exhibit as comorbidities. It could even exhibit as bipolar. It can exhibit as manic depressive. And you could not even have those two comorbidities. It could just be, I mean, not just be, but it could be just the PTSD, the brain damage. Excellent questions. It's a, it's a crime. What these people do is criminal. Criminal. And you know what happens if you stay in the relationship long enough, Christy? with that brain damage, now you're coercible. Now you are so naive and vulnerable to be easily coerced. Talked out of your cars, talked out of your trucks, talked out of your name on your house deed. Talked out, you know, my, my ex-husband convinced me we weren't even married. I believed him. At one time, he convinced me puppies came from eggs, from the brain damage. I know it sounds ridiculous, right? He convinced me. I literally thought puppies came from eggs because of the cognitive distortion, the brain damage. You should call the VA. Hear them. You deserve the help you deserve to get, the care you deserve. And if you have trouble finding it, because a lot of these centers, you know, aren't really equipped yet to teach recovery of codependency they kind of band-aid the wounds then i can certainly help you find the resources you so deserve but you have to book a one-on-one -on -one with me brothers and sisters i have one-on-one -on -one services for consultations to help anybody get started you have to want it though and as you're doing this brothers and sisters as you're developing a team You'll hate it, you'll resist it, and you'll make excuses. And that's also from the brain fog, cognitive dissonance, and brain damage. You're going to hate it, resist it, make excuses. You're going to, you know, the moment you go into the VA hospital and, you know, you meet your first person that you think is cold and harsh, you probably don't want to go back to the VA hospital. You're going to hate it, resist it, make excuses. A lot of vets there at the VA, right? Some badasses there. I know they got good groups at some of the VA hospitals. I'm glad you're calling. But listen, Hiram, let's look at Hiram's statement. Calling the VA hospital soon. Hiram, so a lot of codependents will say a future fake, just like the narcissist. The narcissist will give this future faking, these false promises. Oh, I'll do it tomorrow, babe. Hiram is saying... I'll call the VA hospital soon. The, the sooner you call them, the better. I'll call the VA hospital now. I'll call the VA hospital tomorrow. And you do it because I'll call the VA hospital soon will make you feel like you can, you can put it off for a month, two, three, four, five, or 10 years for all I know. Let's see what else is going on here. Hello, thank you. My therapist was very friendly with me. She was making me laugh every time. I found that laughing and making emotional tie with her was not enough and I'm still not healed. You're not supposed to make an emotional tie with any of us. 
Um, we will act as a pillar of strength for you, like a maternal figure or a paternal figure or a friend figure, but there's no emotional tie. I have to remind clients constantly that, you know, there's a separation. There's a professional separation. So if you're looking for a therapist emotional tie, think again, girl. It's it's unethical. We all have to take laws. You know, we we take these ethical clauses and have to follow laws that we're not allowed to do that. So the laughter thing also, a psychiatrist and a psychologist are not allowed to do that. If you work with a coach, we can use humor. But any therapist, any psychiatrist, any psychologist that's going to use humor and like, I don't know, drop down fucking swear words like I do, run the fuck away from that person. That is unethical. And you yourself have to stop the codependency seeking to emotionally bond. You're looking to emotionally bond with a professional that wants to teach you to stop these bonds. We want to teach you independence, not bond, James Bond. Maybe teach you to be more James Bond. When I told her that I want to comment, commit blank, she told me that I am just a lazy girl. Well, clearly... You and the therapist have the wrong idea of therapy, girl. And you should be reporting her for very unethical things. So codependents learn these things that you are just allowing somebody else to further abuse you because you're in a state of helplessness. First of all, therapists should not be laughing with you. You come with me, I'll teach, you know, I'll laugh with you. We'll be badasses, but I'm not a fucking therapist you know i'm not a counselor i'm a profiler um and you deserve better you know there's s-u-i-c-i-d-e hotlines girl i ran one for 13 years on my own dime out of my own house and when you call them use them call them as much as you need to use them girl she should be telling you, here's the number for this hotline girl. Here's another one. Here's three of them just for you. If this one doesn't work, call this one. When you're done with this one, call that one. Now, hotlines, S-U-I-C-I-D-E, hotlines, just letting you know legally, we're only allowed to talk to you for 20 minutes. Then we have to say goodbye and we urge, you know, just keep calling. Call as many times as you need. But we're only allowed to talk to you for 20 minutes. So let's think about this logically. You need to really think logically. This therapist is abusing me. I really need to think logically like I'm looking for an emotional attachment from a professional that can't provide it. I need to think logically that if she's telling me I'm just a lazy girl for wanting to commit S-U-I-C-I-D-E, I deserve better. I want to think logically that maybe I need an S-U-I-C-I-D-E hotline. And I need to be calling those people because they'll be there for me. Does that help you, girl? Anna. I don't know how to heal from my narcissistic relationship with my mother. You can't heal that. You can't heal the relationship between you and a narcissist. You have to just first come to terms that you'll never heal a relationship with a narcissistic person. It's impossible. Only you can heal. And healing is breaking codependency. I'll, I teach how to do that. But I teach it in conjunction with your social worker, with your case manager, with your talk counselor, with your police, with your attorney, with your advocate, with whomever you have as your team member. We work in unison with each other. It takes a village to help you. And I'm sorry you have to go through that. Christy says, boundaries, capital letter boundaries, exclamation point, Anna, boundaries. But you know what, Christy, see, codependence in Anna's shape can't think logically, don't know how to exhibit boundaries because she's been trained to be abused. She's been trained to be treated like shit. So she's been trained that she's not allowed to speak up and have boundaries, right? I hope that helps you, ladies. You girls deserve so much better than that. 
I did learn a month or two ago that when we coaches incorporate humor, you guys are much more likely to remember what we advised you of that day using humor. So humor is a wonderful tool to use, but you should never be able to find humor in a therapist's office, or I'd fucking run and report. Run and report. I have a fucking fantastic therapist. I've had the same one. She's a child abuse trauma therapist, and I know I'm an adult, but she is perfect for me. And not once has she joked around with me. I mean, I've laughed my ass off in that office, but she's never once joked around with me. It's fucking badass. Real soft spoken, very quiet spoken. She's wonderful. Wonderful. Good questions, ladies. Thank you for joining, brothers and sisters. Anybody else? Questions in capital letters, no medical questions, please. Direct questions only. Questions on boundaries. Questions on tyrant talking tactics. Questions on healing. Questions on how to find a good therapist. Questions on your smear campaign. Come on, open forum here. Open forum. And we have a night with very quiet, no narky narks. I might need to tap on <laughs> laminated wood. We don't got the narky narks in. That's a beautiful thing, brothers and sisters. You know, I think codependency is a, is a very approaching a conversation. I think codependency, you know, you guys don't realize codependency has you longing and begging and yearning and wishing and hoping and just always looking back on heartache, always looking back on pain. Codependency is always wishing for something to be different. Codependency is like thinking, I wish I had somebody because I can't do it myself. I wish and long and beg and yearn and hope and I keep looking back at the past. And even if I don't have that past anymore, let's say that ex is gone, ran off with a new supply, I went no contact with mommy and daddy psycho, then you're still longing, begging, yearning, wishing, hoping, waiting, and you're looking for somebody else to fill, fill those shoes. You're looking for replacements, just the way the narcissist looks for replacements to make themselves feel better. So codependency is a very shitty thing to grow up in, to learn, and then to, once you're grown up, to marry off or partner off intimately with. It's a fucking hell of a thing to break because breaking this kind of pain and codependency on codependent people unhealthy people, dependent on healthy people, you're terrified to break the bond. You're terrified to be alone. You're terrified, I'll never be loved again. You were never loved to begin with. I'm terrified I'll always be alone. I'm terrified I'm not good enough. I'm terrified I won't have a friend. I'm terrified I won't have someone to just be there. So I'm gonna long and beg and yearn and wish and hope and wait. And let's say I even get rid of them from the past. I'm going to try to find replacements in new people. So it's no different than the narcissist brothers and sisters. You guys just exhibit different. You guys have the same traits. You each exhibit differently. Sometimes the same though. Sometimes the same. Boundaries. Approaching a conversation. I must, I'm a little lost, you guys. I'm a little lost. Anna, I hope you get offline right now, girl, and go look up your national S-U-I-C-I-D-E line. And did you know if you're still in an abusive relationship, Anna, if you're with abusers at home, like a mother, father, sister, brother, lover, spouse, if you are still involved in a relationship with a narcissist, 85% attempt, commit, or are coerced talked into unaliving ourselves. 85% of victims to abusers attempt commit or are talked into committing unaliving. I dated a super nice guy once and broke up with him because all I knew was the abuse so it didn't feel natural. Looking back, I've caused a lot of pain too and I hate that. 
Well, Christy, it's nothing to be ashamed of. You were never taught what healthy is. So when you meet a super nice guy, it feels really boring. When you feel a super nice, when you meet a super nice girl or guy, we feel boring. Like if you guys were ever to meet me in person and, and we were to become friends, you'd be bored because I, I reality test relationships now. I'm independent. Codependents just rush right into these juicy, loving, you know, intimately sharing relationships. We're healthy, independent people. We take our time. We don't get into this juicy stuff. We feel boring as fuck to you guys because you like the highs and the lows of arguing and shame and little tidbits of love. Arguing and shame and little tidbits of love. So when you meet a healthy person or a nice person, you will bore you because you're not healed of the codependency. And you have to promise yourself right now that you will not feel ashamed because I guarantee any of those people are not going to hold it against you or think that you're some bad person. The thing is in codependency, <coughs> we push a lot of healthy people away. I did the same thing. So don't feel bad for the mistakes you make coming out of codependency and becoming independent. Golden Chicken Nugget, you have been given a warning once and now that you're trying the same shit on me again, that's just strike motherfucking get the fuck away from me. You don't even get a strike three. Ida, I'm just scared. I just scared one off. He threatened me. But I'm not a criminal. He is not afraid. Well, that really kind of sounds psychopathic. We don't come in and brag on this channel that you just frightened a narcissist off or a criminal off. I highly doubt a codependent can frighten a criminal off. Ida, how'd you do it? How'd you frighten that criminal off? How did he threaten you? And how did you scare him? Because usually criminals scare us. Criminals scare me. I'm a stoic motherfucker, but I'm not a stupid motherfucker. Criminals scare the shit out of me. I deal with criminals. I deal with fucking crazy motherfuckers. Crazy fucks. They scare me. I don't scare them. The thing that scares them is when I expose them. So I'd like to know. It doesn't matter you're from the streets, girl. I fucking live on the streets in the borough. How did he threaten you and how did you scare him off? I've asked you a simple question. Please explain. Answer the question. How did he threaten you and how did you scare him off? Simple, simple answer will suffice. I'm from the streets does not answer my question. So brothers and sisters, we might have a bullshitter in the room here. Probably a borderline flavor because borderlines do this. They talk themselves up on some pedestal, make themselves my equal. They're mirroring me, but she can't answer a simple question. You're not answering the question. How did he threaten you and how did you scare him off? Because those two statements alone are red fucking flags. I'm red flagging your ass. You're on a forensic profiling channel that we use people like you as an opportunity to teach lies, what lies are. He said he would beat me and I said, come over. Okay, you know that makes no sense at all, right? You know now you're contradicting yourself. Because I guarantee if a sociopath said he was gonna beat you and you said, I'd come over, you sound like you're blowing smoke up your own ass. You're what I call the legend in your own mind, borderline. So brothers and sisters, we got a bullshitter in the room. Now she's telling me I misunderstood. Just don't even bother with those people, brothers and sisters. They're just liars, just outright liars. I guarantee brothers and sisters, now I'm a badass, right? I'm stoic. You know, I, I, I could say I'd probably scare a codependent empath, but I don't scare criminals. I scare I don't scare them at all. We don't scare these people at all. We get scared by these people because they're dangerous. Somebody tells me they're gonna come beat me up, I'm gonna be fucking threatened and scared. 
um, normal and healthy and human. A codependent empath is going to be scared that somebody's going to come beat them up. A psychopath, a sociopath, a borderline is going to be like taunting you. Come on, I'll come over. You could beat me up. I'll come over so you could try it. I mean, that's borderline. That's taunting. So, narcissists don't get scared. The only time narcissists get scared is when they're being exposed. Do you know the psychopath never gets scared? Did you hear? The psychopath never gets scared. Ever. So that full of shit borderline, you know, that's just somebody that's so pathetic, looking for attention, mirroring a badass, and then was exposed right in front of everybody. I dated a super nice guy, read that. When people start telling, telling you, you misunderstood. We didn't misunderstand. Her words are all in black and white. When somebody tells you something and you're deducing it logically, and now they're saying you misunderstood because you make sense, that's the red flag giveaway. That's what a, what a playbook method is. Anybody got any questions about that conversation with that girl? That was a good one. We don't get to see that often. Occasionally with the borderline fixated females that come in, they all pretend they're high and mighty and healed and, you know, stoic motherfuckers and badasses and, you know, a badass, a badass knows. It's me, Miss Cleo. Wow. Okay. Now we're getting narcissists in. I shouldn't have spoke. Anybody have any questions about that conversation with that borderline flavor, kind of high and mighty person trying to show off, trying to get us to like her, trying to get us to believe some non-believable nonsense and how she used the playbook. She couldn't answer the direct question. She answered it with, I'm from the streets. I asked her directly again. She still couldn't answer. She answered it with, he threatened to beat me up and I said, I'll come over. I called her out again. She says, I misunderstood. Are you seeing the playbook? What about sociopaths? Do they get scared? I classify the sociopath and the psychopath pretty much the same kind of thing. There's just very slight differences. Neither one do. Neither one do. Um, they're just, they're really not even terms in the, the diagnostic manual. Those terms aren't even in there. We just use them to teach. But neither do the sociopath or the psychopath. There's a couple of really unusual traits about people with sociopathy and psychopathy, just so you guys know. Like you and I could smell a baked, baked uh, chicken in the oven, right? We can smell a flower. We can smell a rose. We can walk in a room or somebody's home and say, oh, you're cooking... Um, you know, are you cooking Chinese food? Because we have, we, our smell is intact. There's something with the psychopath, sociopath, that their senses, their smelling senses are quite different than ours. They have trouble identifying smells. That's why a lot of psychopaths and sociopaths can be around dead bodies, you know, like the Jeffrey Dahmers, because they can't identify smells like you and I can. Another factoid about the psychopath sociopath is they don't sweat like you and I do. Like if somebody, if I was in the presence of somebody or somebody called me up and told me they were going to come beat me up, I'd start sweating. I'd get scared, right? I'm nervous. My body sweats. If I was going to go give a lecture, I'd have anxiety. I might sweat. I'm sweating now being on live stream. Psychopaths and sociopaths don't sweat. Chucky Moda says, something here smells like bullshit. So Chucky Moda, why don't you explain what smells like bullshit to you? Because you're making some kind of accusation with no nothing to back it up with. So Chucky Moda, something here smells of bullshit. But yet, you can accuse but not back it up with anything. Let's use Chucky Moda because he's a typical playbook. He's like a mosquito narcissist. 
Mosquito narcissists, the garden variety narcissists will all do what Chucky Moda is doing. Chucky Moda is just randomly coming on a stranger's live stream and dropping an insultive accusation with nothing to back it up. So just know a narcissist playbook will do exactly what the Chucky Moda do. We might, maybe I should call it the Chucky Moda, you know, the playbook tactic of accusations and criticisms with no factual evidence. Hold on. Oh, we're getting some derelicts in the room. Good morning to you, Leah. Nice to meet you, girl. Nice. Welcome in, everybody. Ladies and gents, welcome in. Open Q&A. Please type your questions in capital letters. Direct questions only. Open to breaking codependency. I'll just give you guys a few minutes. I'm, I'm doing astrology, too. Okay, so let's use the next person who's come in called Echo Eclipse. Echo Eclipse clearly has no social skills, clearly can't read a room, has no ability to communicate effectively either. Echo Eclipse comes in the room and just says two words. Crush confirmed. So imagine Echo, what's his name? Echo Eclipse. Let's say Echo Eclipse walked in a room. Let's say we're all in real life. An echo eclipse walks in the room and just says, crush confirmed. Are any of us going to know what he means? We're not because echo eclipse has no social skills. He can't read social cues. He has no ability to communicate. Now, if echo eclipse walked into a room of narcissists in real life, he walked in the room of narcissists and said, crush confirmed. I guarantee all those narcissists would be like, oh, ha, 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 crunch confirmed. And they'd, they'd understand him. See you later. If a narcissist somehow becomes self-aware, what is likelihood of change? Nothing. Do not let these self-aware narcissists fool you. They have to be in consistent therapy. Behavior modification requires them to go into an institution anywhere from two to six months for something called cold therapy, which can K-I-L-L them because it collapses and mortifies them down to nothingness where they can rebuild. However, let's say they were even slightly able to modify some of the behavior. The sad thing is it would never last. They would revert right back to their narcissistic personality disorder. There is no cure. We feel about 75 years to 100 years, maybe, maybe. But self-awareness does not make them change. It makes them self-aware of a diagnosis. Because let's talk about this too. All narcissists are self-aware of the difference between right and wrong. All narcissists are self-aware that they feel entitled to abuse, to lie, to blame. All self-aware of what they're doing. So when a narcissist becomes self-aware, it means they've gotten a diagnosis of the personality disorder. They're aware now they have a disorder. It's not like they weren't aware of their behavior. They weren't aware of their lying, their cheating, their manipulation, their stealing, their excuse making, their blaming, their devaluing. They're aware. The self-aware is they're aware now they have a personality disorder. I hope that helps. They cannot change. Leah, I'm just answering open Q&A, girl. Feel free to ask a question, any question. No dumb questions. There are no dumb questions. Would the psychopaths sweat if they're, if they're being exposed? No, they don't. They don't sweat when they're exposed. They don't have fear when they're exposed. A narcissist has fear. A narcissist can sweat because they're afraid of getting the shit kicked out of them. They're afraid of, you know, um, let's say you're, 
Let's say you're married to a narcissist who happens to have musical talent. Um, they're afraid that they can't perform, so they'll sweat. A psychopath is so different. Psychopaths don't care. When they're exposed, you'll never get the truth out of them. They're not, not even ashamed. There's just void. There's nothing. There's this void, emptiness. There's no feeling. The psychopath would get enraged or completely cold and shut down. But they don't sweat or get afraid. They don't experience happiness either. Like, have you ever heard a psychopath or a narcissist laugh? Laugh at a good joke? They're not really feeling laughter, brothers and sisters. They can't feel it. That took me a while to learn. Hold on. That took me a long time to come to the understanding of that one. I don't know where that fucking tarot card went. Oh, here it is. Yeah, it took me a long time. I learned that from a psychopath. Because I even said to him, man, you guys know how to laugh. You know, I've been around a psychopath that could bellyache laugh. Can't you feel how fun that feels? And he was like, no. I guarantee your husband was mimicking you. That wasn't the real laugh. See you soon, too, Hiram. Nice to have you here. Thanks for coming in today. Leah S., in my experience, when a narcissist is exposed, they seem to get angrier and spiral. No, that's true, girl. It's part of what's called collapse and mortification. It's part of splitting. It's part of their defenses, that they have to do anything and everything to protect their guilt and shame, that they get angrier. They try harder. They attack further. Your boundaries alone enrage them. Your happiness enrages them. Um, your success enrages them. Your no contact enrages them. These people do spiral. Dan F. Self, are self-aware narcissists more dangerous? Um... I think the self-aware cluster Bs are more dangerous. I think the self-aware narcissists are, you know, they're no different than a dime a dozen. Have you ever listened to like Lee Hammock? He's a self-aware narcissist. He's a real charismatic, handsome guy. You know, but if you've been around profiling or studying the criminal mind or the narcissistic playbook, you can see right through him. Um, I don't think it makes them more dangerous. I think sometimes it makes them more likable because they're using it as a ploy to get gain something from you. In other words, like money and fame, right? The psychopaths are all self-aware, all of them. So they're just dangerous. Borderlines in the secondary psychopathic state are extremely dangerous and they are aware. All right, let's go over this again for Dan. Self-aware narcissist simply means they are aware of their diagnosis. They are aware that they are a narcissistic personality disorder. The narcissist, before they were even diagnosed, have always been self-aware of the difference of right and wrong. Always self-aware of consequences. Always self-aware of their abuse. Always self-aware of their lies, cheating, and excuses. They've always been self-aware that they are vastly different and don't feel like you and I. They've been aware of that self-aware that they've had to go in a mirror and practice facial expressions or practice laughing. They've always been self-aware. A self-aware narcissist is when they come to have somebody diagnose them. That's the difference. Held for review. Let's see what comment is held for review. It says this message is held for review and I have no message held here. Caitlin, it just says hi. Hi, Caitlin. When you talk about a psychopath, it's like you're describing my boyfriend. No feeling, no feeling bad, no remorse, nothing. Well, narcissists and borderlines don't have... Well, narcissists and borderlines have that too. 
So a lot of you guys, by the time you get to me, you all tell me you're, you've been with a malignant narcissist or a malignant psychopath. And by the time you get to me and you explain this person to me, they're not psychopaths at all. It might seem that they're a psychopathic girl, but all narcissists don't care. No narcissist feels remorse. No, none of them do. They will commit the egregious act of lying, cheating, stealing, excuse-making, manipulation, and they will not feel remorse or feeling bad at all. That would be called care and compassion. They can't access those feelings in the frontal lobe. A psychopath is void. Void. Psychopaths are very monotone. Very, there's just, there's, it's a flat affect. There's a flat affect where something should make them smile and their face won't move. You know, you stop to say, look at this pretty butterfly. And there's just nothing there. A narcissist might might not feel anything, but, you know, they'll be more crass. And uh, I don't know. I don't want to get overboard here with explaining. What I'm saying is most of you who think you're with psychopaths, a lot of you aren't, but you think you are. Would you say that the narcissist is or isn't fully aware of the pain? And they are fully aware, all of them. All of them know since a child that they are different. They are fully aware of right and wrong. This is the third time I'm explaining it, Sarah. They are fully aware of when they lie, when they cheat, when they steal, when they abuse. They are fully aware of the pain and hurt they cause others. Fully aware. A self-aware narcissist is when the person gets a diagnosis from a doctor. Otherwise, they're all fully aware. Yes, boundaries. Boundaries enrage them. Do you think you're a narcissist, Stu says? No, I don't think I'm a narcissist at all. I think I'm an independent motherfucking badass. I've had many, I've heard, my audience knows for about two full years, I forced my therapists and doctors to give me tests because I thought I was a narcissist because my abusers had convinced me so much that my strength, my boundaries, my integrity, my loud motherfucking voice, my anger was an abusive thing. I forced these people to give me test after test. No, I don't think I'm a narcissist. Got it? Do you think you're a narcissist, Stu? Have you ever gotten a PCLR test? Have you been brave enough to get a PCLR test like your gal JoJo? Do I think I'm a narcissist? Absolutely not. I know I'm not. Leah, I recommend we don't talk to people in the live streams. I'm teaching forensics here. I'm not teaching like normal narky narc abuse channels where you're going to befriend each other. That's a red flag, Sarah. Don't, don't be chatting back and forth. Well, you guys do what you want. I'm just warning you now. My channel is filled with predators, borderline females out the ass, and they'll always try to connect with you just like I said. Don't be sorry, girl. I'm just warning you, girl. I'll announce it at the beginning of every one of my videos. You guys are putting your life in your own hands, talking to each other on my channel. My channel is made up of three types of narcissists. The borderline fucking fixated woman, female, who if they're not fixated on me, they'll be fixated on one of you in the live stream. The incel man boy who just comes in to egregiously, aggressively criticize or attack the woman and the Jesus thumper fucking altruistic narcissist. So please just know, Leah, you're just on a forensic profiler's channel who wants to teach you safety and defense and red flag behavior is becoming friends with somebody in a live stream. We're strangers here. You're talking to strangers. And, you know, Sarah could think, if Sarah's been listening to my channel, Sarah would have radar on you that you're a red flag. Just so you know, girl, by no fault of your own, not to shame you, to show you. So we break this codependent behavior. Because we, we love to make friends, right? We deserve to make friends. 
No, I'm not an airborne 101. I dated a badass motherfucker who was. Thanks for asking. Wire, I need to know. I don't know what you need to know, Wire. Leah, thanks for letting me teach today, honey. It's not to shame you, it's to show you. Leah, do you know about the Q-tip totem here on my channel? Grab yourself a Q-tip, girl. Quit taking it personally. And just know, the stuff I'm teaching you is not to shame you. It's to show you how to break codependency. So you don't take it personally. And know that it's not directed to make you feel bad or ashamed or you know, feel personally attacked. It's to teach you. Okay, so we've got some, we got another wave of narcissist man boys coming in. This ain't Texas. Clearly it ain't Texas. What else we got? You're welcome, Leah. Thank you. Thank you too, Leah. Thank you. All right. I think my live stream stopped. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that, brothers and sisters. Thank you too, Leah. We teach on this channel. You know, brothers and sisters, there, there have been times where, you know, I mean, I'm six years out here, right? And I've had extensive recovery people around me, extensive professional teams. I've been trained by some of the best minds on the planet. I've been in school every day since October 11th of 2018. You know, I've put my life into getting well, becoming independent, and learning forensic profiling. But the things you guys do, just know that I did too. I did those same things too. So there's no shame here. Are there questions that I can, are there questions that I can, a narcissist, that they won't be able to answer? I think you need to clarify your question first and foremost, Dan. I don't understand what you're saying. Are there questions? Are there questions you can ask a narcissist they won't be able to answer? It is a good room roll to it is a good room to troll Preston because I'm going to point out all the trolls and their immature, typical pathetic man boy behavior. Um, Dan, yes, there are questions a narcissist won't be able to answer. Yes, there are questions a narcissist won't be able to answer. Um, it takes a, it takes a little bit though to work this in because in the love bombing state, they'll give you fake answers. So you'll think you'll be getting an answer, but when you're really, let's say you suspect somebody is a narcissist, you have to suspect they're a narcissist. All right. Let's just clarify that you suspect they're a narcissist. They've exhibited toxic patterns over time. So you suspect they're a narcissist. So one of the questions you can ask them is, you know, what are one of, what's some, what is one of your regrets in life? What is one thing you regret that you could go back and change? Um, what's your biggest flaw? What is the thing you hate most about yourself? What is the thing you're ashamed most about yourself? What is the thing that you're most ashamed of, your biggest regret? I guarantee they won't be able to answer that. And if they try, Dan, it'll be something so external. It'll be something like, oh yeah, my biggest regret, the thing I'm most ashamed of is, you know, I didn't listen to my mother. I should have pursued school. I ended up in real estate instead. I knew I would have been a great surgeon. It'll be external. It won't be something like, God, I, you know, I would, whatever. It won't be a shameful, regretful thing internally. It'll be something external. I don't want to get too deep because I don't want to train narcissists here either. 
Can I name a car for edit? I don't know what the fuck that means. I am in love. I am a love starved empath codependent. Well, that's the first step of healing. Thank you kindly for helping me to work on myself and heal myself. You're welcome, Kyles. You're welcome. Admitting we're love starved to begin with. Admitting we're love starved empaths who have been raised by really fucked up people. Admitting we're love starved empaths that have been in love with really fucked up people and that we got to break this codependency. Um, hold on. I got to report this piece of shit. I don't tolerate sexual predators in this room. So, Kyle's, admitting we're love-starved, empathic, codependents, you know, is the beginning of healing. Admitting that these people we think we love is so vastly different than the way they've made us feel. That love truly isn't pain. That these abusive, dysfunctional people have taught us abusive, dysfunctional behavior. They've tried to make us like them. They tried to make us into a version of them. And it feels so uncomfortable coming into independence. Just take your time. Take all the time you need. Like I said, Kyle's, I'm on six years and I'm still learning. Now, Slay Queen, I'm still waiting for you to answer. What does name a car for edit mean? Because I'm a car fucking freak. I love muscle cars. Somebody ever wants to talk about cars? I'm right there. Kaylin Andrea. Hi. Hi. Do narcissists... Do narcissistic parents create avoidant attachment style in their children? Yes. In the narcissist. Um... Avoidant attachment generally, I'm just speaking generally, is a narcissist, the psychopath, the borderline. The insecure attachment, I'm not into attachment theory. I just, I think it's a fucking pseudoscience, first of all. It's just my opinion. <sighs> because now that's like the hopped on train everybody's jumping on that they think avoidant attachments is just the nicer name for a narcissist. Um, avoidant attachment styles are destructive. Abusive, egregious, cruel, cold, incapable of intimacy. And the avoidant attachment is the style the narcissist grows up with. The borderline will grow up with like a disorganized or disorganized attachment style. And a lot of codependents grow up with like an insecure attachment style. And the reason I don't believe in attachment theory is because codependents can shift their attachment style. But narcissists and borderlines can't unless they're in like a borderline in a psychopathic state, but then they revert right back. So I don't believe in attachment theory. And it's just, like I said, it's like the pseudo thing right now to get people to believe that cruel, abusive people can change. The answer is yes, Dan, it, they do. The golden child will grow up avoidant. The abused, neglected, you know, punished child will grow up avoidant. The codependent empath love starved will grow up with an attachment disorder, an attachment style, but not avoidant. It's more insecure. It could be disorganized too. How do I stop thinking about my toxic ex? I hate him and healing would be great. He wasn't... He was emotionally abused and lastly physical. Now he won't stop messaging me and my family. Okay, well, that's a loaded ass question. No name one, two, three. No name one, two, three. How do I stop thinking about my toxic ex? Number one, get some help. Hire a professional. Are you working with a talk counselor? No name. Do you have a talk therapist? Do you have a physician? Do you have a coach? Do you have a counselor? Do you have a social worker? That's number one. I hate him. Healing would be great. Would be? Okay, you can start healing anytime. It can be great. He was emotionally abused and lastly physical. We don't make excuses for why narcissists grow up to abuse. I was emotionally abused as a child. I was viciously, vilely, 
physically, S-E-X, emotionally, all, every kind of abuse you could imagine. I don't grow up abusing people. Stop using that as some kind of reason why an abuser is, you know, abuses. Stop. Now he can't stop messaging me and my family. Oh, yes, he can. Change your goddamn phone number. Change your email. Tell your parents. Stop ask, answering the phone. Get the fuck out of your parents' house. Change your email. Change your stuff. Go no contact. Your loaded question is somebody I see every damn day who will never do any of the things I just suggested. So no name one, two, three. You'll, you won't stop thinking about the toxic ex because you won't get a recovery team. Number two, healing is something you're probably terrified of and you'll make every excuse in the book. Three, you're enabling somebody's abusive behavior. And four, you going no contact is compared to detoxing off of heroin. It's called detoxing off a trauma bond. So people like you end up wasting my time because you'll come and use me. You'll be on this channel asking goddamn questions like that and you'll never take the advice. I'm sorry. I just profiled your ass. You're what I call a victim narcissist. I'm certain you've been victimized, but you're not um, empathic because empaths get the help they need. Narcissists don't. Do narcissistic parents create avoidant? Yes, they do. How am I doing today? Thank you for asking. <laughs> Nobody ever asks me that. Thank you for asking, Kaylin Andrea Fernandez. Thank you, girl. I'm doing great, except for a raspy voice, because on Wednesday nights, I sing and I blow my vocal cords out and I smoke a lot when I'm on the video because I get super nervous when I, I'm doing live stream. Thank you for asking. That was so nice of you. Hi, can, I, can you do my tarot readings? LOL. No, I can't. LOL. Skyler. No, they don't change, says Sky Glitter. They don't change. They can't change. They won't change because they don't think they need to change. Hey, Jojo. Hey, Bob. Nice to see you, brother Bob. Abusers are always abusers. Yes, they are. You know, when codependent, love-starved empaths hurt somebody's feelings or violate a boundary or lose, lose somebody that doesn't want to be friends with them anymore, man, we feel terrible. We feel horrible that we've hurt somebody. It'll grate on me. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm going to give you an example. Thanks, Brother Bob. I'm going to give you an example of <laughs> Sky Glitter. So a month ago, <laughs> my, uh, my counselor, my one therapist, um, I changed health insurances. And I didn't realize my copay went up. So when she gave me the bill, I was like, what, what the fuck is going on here, Rita? And she's like, well, your copay went up. And man, I fucking lost it. Like I catastrophized. I have this codependent issue with catastrophizing because I get really nervous about my safety because I've been homeless and I've been, you know, I've been almost murdered three times in the year and lost everything. So when it comes to my safety, I can catastrophize. So I raised my voice and I got really panicky with Rita. And I was like, oh my God, this can't be right. And I started freaking out. <laughs> and uh, she was like, don't worry. We can talk about it on our next session. So a month later, I just saw her like last Wednesday. I mean, I went in. The first thing I said to her was, my God, Rita, I'm so sorry that I freaked the fuck out about, you know, this new copay. It's been great on my mind, like all month that I, you know, I freaked out in front of you over something so stupid. And, and we feel bad, right? When we abuse our, you know, we get dysregulated or we get angry or we think we're abusing. And she had to like sit me down and say, first of all, 
there's nothing to feel bad over. Secondly, you know, you're allowed to catastrophize. You've been through the ringer, girl. You know, you've been, you were almost murdered. You know, you were, you were stripped of everything. I understand you get nervous. You didn't treat me bad. You just raised your voice and you started your panic attack. You didn't take it out on me. But my codependent empathic mind was bothered for a month that I hurt her feelings. So Sky Glitter says, abusers are always abusers. And whoever said <laughs> they, they don't have any feelings, they don't. We do. Is there any way I can have some insight on my situationship I have going on with this Capricorn? Caitlin, girl. What's a Capricorn doing? What's Cappy doing? And what sign are you? What's Cappy doing? Tell me first what Cappy's doing, and then tell me secondly, what sign are you? It's rough. I kind of need some clarity. You got it, girl. I'll try my best. They never take advice. Do you record your live streams? Yes, I do, Brother Dan. After this live stream's over, it'll be up for anybody to re-watch. You can send it to all your friends. Well, I don't know. I don't want you to, I don't want to be sent to all your friends. I hope you can use it for educational purposes. Probably all of your friends, Dan, are sloppy motherfucking codependents, and I guarantee about 85 to 90% of them are psychopathic borderlines and or narcissists. You can record it. I prefer that you don't send it to your friends, though. But you do what you need to do, brother. That's good. I'm glad you're doing all right, by the way. Thank you, Kaylin. Yup, real impacts, fighting spirits. We don't talk about religious dogma. These are not demons inside of people. These are people that choose to abuse. It has nothing to do with demonic possession. Okay, Gemini Flames, we don't talk religious dogma on my channel. It's the biggest red flag as a profiler. The biggest red flag as a profiler. Okay, so promise yourself right now, Gemini Flames, I give people three strikes, you're out here. The first strike is we don't we don't relate religious dogma to narcissists. Go on some fucking spiritual channel and do that shit. It's not welcome here. It's a fucking red flag here. Okay? Now let's get back to whoever asked me about Capricorn. Bob, I'm an empath. Sky glitter. You know there's no such thing as the word empath, right? I just use it for teaching purposes. There's no such thing as the word empath. It's super narcissistic to call ourselves empaths. I prefer if you guys learn to call yourselves codependent, love-starved empaths, or love-starved people with empathy. I can't believe I found you live. Enjoy your content. Wondering how you became a profiler. I survived a fucking psychopath attempting to murder me three times. <laughs> That's how. <laughs> And my natal chart, I got into astrology. I've been studying the esoteric art forms for, I don't know, 40-something years. Long time. Over 40 years. And when I got into astrology, I looked at my natal chart, and it just made so much sense that I should... I mean, my tarot birth cards are the justice card and the fucking high priestess. My north node is in the ninth house with Gemini and Jupiter there. I am all about moral and ethical law, and I've got a 12th house stellium that takes predators down and exposes them because it, it squares my 6th house Saturn. I'm good at what I do. I have somebody tried to murder me three times in one year. He was called my husband, and I made a vow to myself on October 11th, Lara, that I was going to learn anything and everything I could about why I could not, I was going to learn everything, how I was never going to allow anybody to ever talk me out of my truth and blame their repulsive behavior on me. And that's how it all started. And I popped around. I thought I might become an attorney. I took a summer full of law class through Harvard and I was like, this ain't for me. I knew psychology and psychiatry wasn't for me because I've already been down that road. 
Um, and I just knew by my natal chart, I'm going to be really good at catching criminals. I'm super, like it's all right here in front of my face. It's my natal chart. And plus surviving. Surviving murder. Three attempted murders. Including a coma, girl. Including a coma. Good question. I was married to an extremely abusive man. I left when the last time he choked. I saw how difficult it was for him to stop. He did this in front of our two-year-old. Katarina. What a beautiful name. Katarina. Katarina. You're describing a sociopathic, psychopathic person. Perhaps a borderline in that secondary psychopathic state. I'm not here to diagnose, but um, if you're ever explaining somebody putting their hands on a woman like this, I'm going to tell you right now, it took me and the people I work with almost eight years to get strangulation as an abusive law. So when you explain what that man done, done to you, don't ever use the word C-H-O-K-E-D. Use the word S-T-R-A-N-G-L-E-D. That will get you immediate restraining orders. It'll get you immediate court dates. That'll get you immediate PFAs. That'll get you immediate law enforcement. That'll get you an immediate advocate. Don't use the word C-H-O-K-E-D. Come work with me. I'll help you out with that one. I'm sorry a little kid had to see that. That's devastating. And we need to get out of these relationships to save our children. Please, brothers and sisters, one of the gravest mistakes I made is I golden child my daughter I golden child that kid's ass and she grew up borderline she grew up dangerous leave save the children we don't stay for the children we get out for the children sky glitter laugh my ass off you rock lady sky glitter I don't like love bombing I'll take it as a compliment but you don't want to love bomb a healthy person. It sounds really creepy to us. You codependents love that love bombing shit. You guys suck that shit up because you're so love starved of compliments. We healthy people, it kind of, it gets cringy. Wait till you guys become independent and you hear the first time somebody love bombs you, you're going to be like, oh my God, well, that's creepy. <laughs> He's very vague with me. Oh, this is the Capricorn. He's very vague with me. He won't tell me much, but he's kind of known around town to be a playa and to be with other females. Well, Kaylin, what the fuck are you doing with a playa? Zebras do not change their stripes, girl. Come on, do I really need to give you an astrology reading for that? Just to appease you, Kaylin, about your Capricorn. Listen, he's got Jupiter, Uranus, and Taurus in his fifth house. That's the house of jumping around and cheating big time, Jupiter. That's the house of playing games, big time. Fifth house, Jupiter, Uranus. That's the house of him, Uranus, leaving your ass, detaching from you, and going off for a bigger, you know, score. Fifth house. You deserve better, Caitlin. He ain't going to tell you much. You'll never, you will never get the truth from these people. Can you have a cluster B and be neurodivergent? If so, all right. You need to kind of um, clarify because cluster B and neurodivergent, you know, mesh. So everybody can have comorbidities, Laura. Just to, just to simplify it for you, Laura. Cluster B can be neurodivergent. Neurodivergent can be cluster B. Cluster B could be bipolar. Bipolar could be NPD. They're called comorbidities. Any cluster B could have any comorbidity, as does a neurodivergent, as does anybody. I don't want to complicate things. What I want you guys to look at are patterns of toxic behavior. If we concentrate too much on someone else's diagnosis, Number one, we have no right to diagnose or understand a diagnosis because we're not forensic psychiatrists. Only forensic psychiatrists and forensic psychologists should be concentrating on that person. So I want to teach here, toxic patterns are toxic patterns. I don't want you to be confused with cluster Bs and psychopaths and sociopaths. I want you to just learn the behavior, the patterns. I want you to concentrate on you. 
We've done enough concentrating on these abusers, have we not? Have you not put enough time in to that abuser? Why are you still fixated on the abuser's diagnoses? How about we look at our own codependent toxic stuff? Laura, hope that helps, girl, because I don't want this channel to be that way. I don't want it to be where we're breaking it down with comorbidities. Is that fair? Fair enough? Those comorbidities get pretty shaky with me. Do you think there's merit or some sort of rationale behind astrology? Why or why not? Well, Dan, yes, I most certainly do. Number one, we wouldn't have maps without astrology. You wouldn't have those globes in every classroom. You wouldn't have maps. Back in my day, we used to have maps in our car. You wouldn't have a GPS system. You wouldn't have one of those TomToms way back in the day. You wouldn't have Google, you know, travel companion. You wouldn't have a watch. You wouldn't be able to tell time. You wouldn't have the days of the week without astrology. Moon's Day, Monday, Moon's Day, Tuesday, Tears Day, the day of Mars, Wednesday, Woden's Day, the day of Mercury, Thursday, Thor's Day, the day of Jupiter, Friday, Frigo's Day, the day of Venus, Saturn's day, Sun's day, without astrology. They wouldn't be able to navigate across the seas or underwater in them submarines without astrology. They wouldn't know about where the planets are and how they revolve around the sun. They wouldn't know the orbits without astrology. They wouldn't have religious books without astrology, whether it's Muslim or fucking Santeria for that matter, whether it's Satanism, whether it's Catholicism, whether it's Christianity, whether it's Hindu, without astrology. Astrology is not a pseudoscience. Astrology makes up your psychology. We wouldn't have psychology without astrology. We wouldn't have stoicism without astrology. We wouldn't have life without astrology. The sun rises every day, right? You can't deny it. The sun is astrology. The moon sets. We wouldn't have seasons. We wouldn't have the four seasons without astrology. We wouldn't have a calendar without astrology. Astrology. I wonder why some certain religion, just one of them religions, is telling you, don't you dare believe in astrology, even though their whole book is about astrology. I think astrology is very real, brother. The guilt doubt of, am I the abuser? After abuse is rough. It's been, thank you for explaining that happened to you too. AJ Brooks, it scared the shit out of me. It made me run to a therapist immediately. It's the cruelest part of coming into the knowledge, the gnosis of why you believe that. Because you've been convinced you're nothing. You've been convinced you're a problem. You've been convinced you're worthless. I hate you. I wish you were dead. You've been convinced you're problematic. You're always angry. You're never satisfied. You're crazy. You've been convinced you're abusive. You're wrong. It's your fault. You've been convinced. I didn't say that. You, you're making things up again. You've been convinced. You're crazy. Now, asking, am I a narcissist? Am I an abuser? Narky Narc channels will tell you, even if you're asking, it just simply means you're not. If you're asking if you're a narcissist, get to a psychiatrist. Because the people who really care are going to get are going to ask, please diagnose me. Tell me if I am or am not. And it's nothing to be ashamed of, brothers and sisters. It's called reactive abuse. You've been trained to act like a narcissist. They've switched identities with us. They've run off with yours and they've put theirs into you. You're left for dead with their identity as they run off and fall in love with the new supply. The new supply is falling in love with you and a version of themselves. Don't ever feel ashamed that you feel like you've become a narcissist. Please go get the PCL to our test. And even if you have to tell your therapist, I need, an, I need you to do the test again. I need you to do it again because a good therapist will be like, okay, no problem. Because I did it to mine for two years, almost two years. You're welcome. I am not codependent. If anything, I am an empath. Katarina. That is so psychopathic to tell a forensic profiler. There is no such thing as an empath. And to proclaim you're an empath puts you on this godly pedestal. You're some kind of la-la-light worker empath. 
I'm an empath just like you. I got empathy, meaning we have empathy. Healthy people have empathic qualities. You codependents are codependent. If you're calling yourself an empath, I would ganter to say that might even be a narcissist, girl. Strike two. Katharina, you get three strikes on my channel. You're on a forensic profiler's channel, girl. We teach facts here. Facts, not delusion, not fantasy, not opinion, not bias, not emotional reasoning. We teach fact. There's no such thing as an empath. You are codependent with empathy. Oof, this story hits hard. It's hard not to feel horrible, but because it's still how we acted at the time, Candace, I got a motto here. I want you to write this down. Don't feel bad for feeling bad. You're allowed to feel bad now. Ain't nobody gonna shame you. Ain't nobody gonna tell you don't feel that way. You know, when we don't have the abuser in the house anymore, they still live in our head, Candace. They tell us, you better feel horrible because you feel so horrible. You better feel bad because you feel so bad. You're just bad. How dare you feel bad like this? How dare you feel horrible? Don't feel bad for feeling bad. We have to process being able to feel now because nobody let us feel before. We were shamed for feeling. Don't feel bad for feeling bad. Feel bad as much as you need to for as long as you need to. I really like how you share information. However, I think on some points, well, Katharina, you get strike three now. Katharina keeps wanting to debate me because she doesn't like fact. Katharina, let me explain something to you, girl. I've been in school for six solid years and have 13,000 hours of education under my belt. Do you know 10,000 hours makes a person an expert based on facts? Do you know I've been trained by some of the best minds in the world on the facts that I come to teach you? Do you know I've dealt with people like you for 58 years debating me out of your bias and opinion? Because bias and opinion doesn't stand up to fact, Katarina. And the fact of the matter is Katarina is feeling personally criticized, personally rejected, personally abandoned, personally punished, personally attacked because she doesn't like facts. And she wants to debate all of us just like every narcissist has debated us in the past because they don't want to come to the acceptance that we might actually know something more than their bias and opinion. I am a fucking expert. I don't even like to call myself an expert. I got 13,000 hours and I still feel bad calling myself an expert. You want to tell me your expertise, girl? I'll listen up all you want. Tell me your expertise and I'll listen as to why you think I'm a little off base because you can't even tell me why I'm a little off base. See, a healthy person with facts would say, hey, you know what? I think you're a little off base because I've heard the term empath in a psychological diagnostic manual. Show me the fucking facts, girl. Strike three, bitch. Goodbye. Goodbye, borderline girl. All right, brothers and sisters, let's talk about this. How many? Let's show a hand. Show me an emoji. How many people are sick and tired of narcissists debating you till you're blue in the face because you can have factual evidence, six years of education and 13,000 hours, and they're still going to try to debate you? How many of us have been debated out of our expertise, right? Strong arm. Let's see the strong arm emoji. Because they have no, no basis to base the opinion about. They'll just roll off. I just disagree with a few little things where somebody with fact will fucking bitch smack them. I'm willing to debate anybody. I hope somebody calls me out on my bullshit. And when you do, you show me the evidence. Because I guarantee I can sit any narcissist down in a police station, show them the evidence in front of them, the facts. Show them all the facts. I can show them six years of their facts, of their crimes, and evidence. I can show there's 13,000 hours of factual evidence of that criminal's behavior, and you know what they'll do? Exactly what that girl did. I disagree. I disagree with these little points. Even though you got evidence, even though it's factual evidence, I'm going to debate you, because that's what narcissists do. I told you I've got three types of narcissists on this channel. The borderline female flavor fixated 
on their favorite person who does exactly what she's done. I get the incel man boy woman bullier and I get the Jesus Bible thumper, which is called the altruistic narcissist. All three of them come in this room constantly. They hate facts, brothers and sisters. I hated facts in the beginning of learning this. I despised some of these things. I wanted to fight them. When I was taught narcissists are incapable of love, narcissists never loved me, narcissists always wanted to destroy me, that the love was never real, that they think this way, I fought it tooth and nail until the truth started to open up my brain and make sense. And then I couldn't debate the fact and evidence anymore and I wanted to learn more and more and more. Those people annoy the fuck out of me because I've lived with them for 50 fucking two years. My ex-husband was the debating fucking <sighs> galloping Sagittarius. And my father was a debater too. And the shit coming out of his mouth was pathetic, biased opinion. I don't do it anymore. I'll debate facts open to debate, facts and evidence, resources, peer-reviewed journals, papers, articles, whatever you want to bring in my fucking face, I will humble myself and say, my God, you're right. I should have learned this fact. Thank you so much. Thank you for showing me this evidence. I am so sorry I've dealt with abusive relationships with an estranged husband before. Oh, I don't deal with them now, girl. I fucking take people down. I catch these people now, girl. It would have bothered me years ago. It doesn't bother me anymore. I sent him a nice big piece of chocolate cake after the divorce was over. <laughs> I'm good at what I do. I get you closure. I get you the closure you guys deserve. I'm such a sleuth. Good for you, Sky Glitter. I'd love to see your natal chart. Your story is amazing how you got to where you are. So glad you got through it. Very inspiring. Le Leah, Leah, I lost my faith through it. I used to be a reverend in the apostolic church with my loud mouth Leo voice. I used to preach and uh, I lost my faith through it. I will no longer serve God. I've had screaming matches with God of why I'm still alive. But because I lived through three attempted murders, I needed to do something. I was either going to continue to be murdered and destroyed by these people or I would expose them and fucking take them down, send them to prison. Maybe well, they'll get slayed. Thank you for letting it be an inspiration to all you guys. Listen, I was a fucked up, sloppy, love-starved, codependent mess with all of these toxic behaviors that you guys do with the love bombing and the excuses and... You know, the denial and all of these little things, right? The seven ways you gaslight. I was right there too. And if I can do it, brothers and sisters, I was fucked up, man. <laughs> and now I'm stoic. If I can do it, so can you. Not love bombing. I, I start out with my girlfriends like that. I'm not love bombing you. I am dependent. I give compliments when I feel they are true. <laughs> I have to tell my one girlfriend that. Be like, girl, you're a badass. I'm not love bombing you, promise. I'm not love bombing you. <laughs> Gemini Flame says, that's me right now. LOL, it is creepy. It's fucking cringy and creepy. Cringe more like it. It is cringy. And you know what, too, ladies and gentlemen, with the love bombing? Borderlines and narcissists will utter identical, identical love bombing statements. They prove it to me on my open comments all the time. If they can even find them. When they find them. They'll all say the same thing. Oh my God. An open comment. I just wanted to tell you you're amazing. Oh wow. I'm so excited. An open comment. Just wanted to let you know. Your channel is incredible. Your personality is awesome. And they say the identical love bombing statement. It's creepy. It's fucking creepy. Lara says, thanks for sharing. Gives me hope that I can also heal and give back. My aunt tells me all the time, what can we learn from this? Better to learn from bad experience because, better to learn from bad experience and they become lessons to heal. Do 
to heal, right? And to share and to help others, maybe. That's when we want to help others, when we're independent. We have the experience. We've healed the codependency. Now we can see it in somebody else who comes to us for advice, and we can help them instead of codependently, you know, trying to fix people. What can we learn from this in stoicism we take every day as, you know, life, life is like a challenge. What did we learn today? We go over what we learned every day before we go to sleep. What we learned, what we should have done or could have done better, what we shouldn't have done, what we did do, what we've learned. We do it every night before we go to sleep. That's called stoicism. It's badass. Your auntie must be a stoic. Kaylin, I figured that. I'm trying to move on, but he keeps trying with me. Honey, he keeps trying because you keep letting him. No contact is, is a form where you don't have any roots where they can contact you. You have to. If you want to be rid of them, and I'm not saying you guys have to do anything, but in order to feel better, you have to come to terms that you need help. You have to come to terms. You need to go full no contact, change your number, your email, get off social media, you know, move residences if you have to, get the healing team, your social worker, your case manager, your therapist, your doctor, your person like me, in order to get well, in order to break free from this abusive cycle, you have to come to terms with. You have a lot to do. You have a lot to do to block them with a full no contact. And doing no contact is, is going to mean that you're going to go through a detox like heroin. You need a professional team around you. You have to come to this acceptance. You're never going to feel better without doing these things. I'm just sorry to say this. I, I'm not even sorry to say this. It's the only thing that helped me. And I was chasing healing for 48 years. Nothing worked until I got reality checked. That I needed a reality check. Hiring a psychopath to teach me no contact and hiring best teams of resources that are concurrent. I still have resource members in my life all the time because that's how I got well. I needed reality. So we have to come to reality. Codependency keeps you in this longing, begging, yearning, wishing, hoping, chasing. The magic fix. The magic person. Instead of being reality based and saying, I don't want this anymore. I want to feel better. I'm going to feel worse before I feel better. Because no contact is going to be egregious. No contact is going to be like I'm detoxing off heroin and if I've been in that relationship longer than two years it's a long detox and my no contact has to be all new phone numbers and everything because every person in my life is destructive the only healthy people I should have around me are my social worker case manager therapist coach strategist advocate whomever your attorney those are the only people you have in your life and it scares codependence because you're codependent. You haven't learned independence. I figured that. I'm trying to move on. They never tell the truth. Never. They always make the situation fit their needs. You guys ever watch a police interrogation? Just watch one of them. That's a narcissist. It'll frustrate the living shit out of an untrained ear to listen to a police interrogation. Once you get into the work I'm in, you love police interrogations. They're fucking awesome. You get to learn something about them every day. It just hurts. Like, I really did love this guy and hoped for the better. Well, Kaylin, I keep talking about codependence like you're not even listening, Kaylin. Kaylin! Codependency wishes and longs and yearns and begs and hopes they'll change. Narcissists can't change, girl. Come on. You're on like strike three at this point. I'm just going to let you stay in the room because if you utter one more thing that goes against everything I just explained, then I'm booting you out, girl. I kind of feel your desperation. But listen, I don't like to repeat myself over and over. And clearly, 
Codependent empaths don't listen. Narcissists don't listen. You've been trained to have narcissistic mirror. Honey, you can't just try to have better without a team, without coming to reality. All right? I can't. I'm sorry, girl. I got to say goodbye. Good luck, honey. If you really want help, DM me. IG DM me. The real people who want real help will get the real help. People like you drain me. People like you will never listen. People like you won't take the advice. If you hit me up, IG DM, I'll unblock you. You're welcome back. Anytime. As for now, girl, you exhaust me. You just show a pattern of that what the, I'm used to. People that drain and use me and don't listen. Dan F., can you help me interpret my tarot birth cards? I certainly can, Dan. Come book your astrology reading, dude. My astrology readings are an eighth of the price of any professional astrology reader, which includes your tarot birth card, your tarot... Um, I forget what it's called. It just took a class with an old teacher of mine. And he told me what it was called. It's something like tarotology, but I'm fucking it up. It's not tarotology. It's something like tarotology, where I run a wheel of the tarot cards on you through a program. And it will include your other natal chart placements of tropical, sidereal, and all kinds of cards of destiny and your tarot birth cards. Come book your one-on-one -on -one with that, brother. My readings are $333 for about five hours. And the average reader, astrologer, will charge you fucking 12, 800 to 1200 bucks for a half an hour. Okay? Oh my God, another one of you live. Sophie, yes, oh my God, oh my God. There's nothing to be oh my God about. You can always catch the rerun of the lives, Sophie. AJ Brooks, I ran straight back to therapy too. LOL, good for you, AJ Brooks. Candace, 100%. Skibs, slimes, slime, ASMR, I gotta, okay. Anybody who loves ASMR, I'm sorry, you're not welcome on my channel. I've already explained the correlation between ASMR and NPD. I'm sorry. Big clicks just happened in my brain. Wow, good for you. We call them breakthroughs. You know how codependents have these breakdowns where we're crying from our soul and we're like, <laughs> <laughs> when you work with a team, when you work with coaches and strategists and counselors, you got breakthroughs. Things go off in your brain and it's like these light bulbs. Like this lead blanket comes off your head and this light bulb appears and you're like, wow, that's a breakthrough. You don't cry. You don't break down. Okay, what's next? I know exactly who I am. Do you? <laughs> Red flag, girl. You're on a profiler's channel. Sky glitter. Sky glitter. Okay, I've been watching you. Watching you up talk yourself. Sky glitter says, I know exactly who I am. Abusers can't take anything from me again. Come on, Sky Glitter, what are you doing on a channel like mine then? Because if you did know who exactly you are and you were an independent motherfucking badass, I highly doubt you'd need any channel like mine or any narc coach's channel because people who know exactly who they are don't go around to random live streams and say, I know exactly who I am. Abusers can't take anything from me again. And you're doing this in a live stream filled with predators. Okay, Sky Glitter, sorry girl, I red flagging your ass fast, borderline. And ass, girl, nice to see you. You've talked about the golden child black sheep dynamic in narc families. What about only children of, say, narcissistic mothers enabling passive fathers? Good question. You might be given the role of both. Anna S. You might have been both the scapegoat and the golden child where everything was blamed. You were ridiculed, neglected, childhood emotional neglect, which is devastating, you know, blamed, criticized, but then you were made a golden child. You had to perform. So you had to take maybe two roles of being the garbage receptacle and then the 
um, representative of the status quo for the family. That's a little bit different. That's a hardcore kind of thing psychologically to grow up with girl. So the only child can can be a couple of different things, Anna asked. They could be full scapegoat, you know, completely unwanted, just used as a garbage receptacle of hatred and blame and disdain. They could be a total golden child where they're just uplifted as like the um, trust fund kind of baby, you know, where they can do no wrong and spoiled breath. And believe me, you don't need a trust fund to be a golden child. Or the only child can grow up and be both scapegoat and golden child, which can be very confusing in those two roles. Excellent question. Unfortunately, not a completely solid answer. You can grow up one, two, or three of those types of children, sadly. But excellent question. Candace, thank you. I appreciate that reminder. Good, you're welcome, girl. I'm glad. Blue-eyed Chippewa. We got a lot of muscles here. We've all been we've all been debated by these people. When I debate my narcissistic ex, why are you debating your ex? The exes are exes for a reason, DNCT. He just stays delusional and argues back. It made me have anxiety and go catatonic. Well, no wonder you're catatonic. Exes are exes for a reason. What are you debating with your ex for? Are there children involved? They will tell you how it isn't their fault. Even Chris Watts. You everybody know who Chris Watts is? The family annihilator. He killed his pregnant wife and his two little toddlers, little girls, and then threw their bodies in an oil tank. Okay. They will never admit it's their fault. Right to the very end where, again, evidence in front will prove it's their fault. And they will justify it. Even Chris Watts will say, I don't know what came over me. It's not like me. I wasn't myself. It's not my fault. You know, I'm a Christian man. I found Jesus in prison. I expect to get out, you know, and become a good citizen. This guy believes it wasn't his fault. He's a psychopath. He's a family annihilator. My ex also talked over me so that I never could debate back. DNCT. We all end up, when our exes did have debated us, most of us codependents have ended up just agreeing with them because the debating just got so ridiculous. I used to say something like, yes, a master, yes, a master. Why are you asking me, Maza? You're only going to talk me out of it, Maza. What do you want me to say, Maza? So it used to become a joke like to me because his debating, we just end up giving up and just saying, okay, you know, what do you want me to answer? They always talk over you. Not always, but a lot of them do. Hi, Rosa Bell. Nice to meet you. Dan, do you think narcissism and other personality disorders are on the rise? Yes, I do. So does people in my line of work. Why or why not? Is it social? Does technology play a role? Yes. Cowboy. Sorry. You just saw... <laughs> you just saw my PTSD in action. That's called a startle reflex. PTSD, the trauma still lives in my body. My body keeps score. So you guys got to witness a startle reflex. Okay, narcissism and other personality disorders are on the rise. Number one, because of social media, right? The user. What's on your mind, user? Do you agree to these terms and services? User, user, let's share your dinner plate and what's on your mind, user. So it's discorporated from the human condition. Secondly, we've all gone through, you know, we've gone through some devastating um, thing we call COVID-19, right? Where everybody had to go in isolation and stand six feet, six, six, six feet apart. That played a big role. The terrible um, problems with parenting. That's a big role. The inability for people to communicate effectively. That's playing a huge role. So it used to be about 1% to 2% of the population were NPD and ASPD. Then it kind of raised to 6%, then 10%. Then we started suspecting about 25%, but because of WOKE-ism and all of the compounded other things I just mentioned, 
we suspect about 40% of the population is disordered in some way, shape, or form, and at least 80% of the population is codependent. The 20% are logical, ethical, healthy, and moral, and we're hated for it by the 80%. Mental illness is on the rise. Teen SUI, C-I-D-E is on the rise. Um, child S-A-S-E-X abuse on the rise. Divorce on the rise. Monogamy, long gone. S-E-X perversion on the rise. We have an epidemic. I think that's the real virus, sadly. And the only way we're going to cure it is people like you and I getting well and teaching, teaching it. And when you teach like me, brothers and sisters, or advocate or, you know, whatever you decide to do with a career involving teaching others, just expect you're not doing it for money or likes because A, you're going to be hated. B, it's going to be extensively hard and there are going to be narcissists trying to take you down left and right. And C, there's not any money in it because the money goes right back into either, you know, helping somebody else out or getting them services or, you know, putting gas in your tank or getting a nice suit to go bother a politician or a DA. So you just have to really have the heart and morals for it. I honestly don't think there's hope personally, but, you know, I don't want to burst anybody's bubble. I have, a, I have a couple videos called Pluto, the Pluto Generations cuts Rahu into K2 to explain why. And I have another video called The Astrologer's Oath, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. Both of those videos talk about the uprise of personality disorder and the destruction we're facing because I don't believe there is any hope. It's hard enough to get people to even book an appointment, brothers and sisters. Hard enough for you guys to pick up the phone and talk to a counselor. Hard enough for you to go into a doctor's office to make sure you don't got PTSD and you're going to die of heart failure or a brain aneurysm or a fucking kidney failure. Hard enough for you guys to want to get help. How do you think this is going to change? It's actually helpful to be told empath is not a way of life. But a strong positive, it's not a personality trait, Gemini Flames. The word empath is made up by the lightworker movement. The word empath is non-existent in any diagnostic manual. It is non-existent in any forensic psychology manual. It is non-existent anywhere except for the La La Lightworkers and those spiritual fucking commanders. The word empath is short for empathy, empathic, empathy. And the empath is a narcissist who's claiming they're an empath. It's not a trait. It's a shortened version of a word that a sect of people who are really fucking personality disordered narcissists gained for themselves to try to make themselves feel better. Come on, Gemini flames, strike two with your magical shit. What days and times do you go live? Friday nights? Saturday nights? I was changing Saturdays up during the afternoon, and I've been told you guys like me to come on Sunday afternoon. Every Monday, I do a live stream lesson about breaking codependency. So Monday is a live stream lesson. Friday night, I asked you guys if you wanted tarot or open Q&A. Open you guys chose open Q&A tonight. So Fridays is usually tarot or question. And then Saturday and Sunday, I don't know, mid-afternoon, um, early afternoon Pacific Standard Time, we go as long as we want for pretty much, um, it's just a mishmash of things. Thanks for asking, Leah S. Good, I'm glad you guys are retracting some of your stuff because you don't want to be around any of these predators that come into my channel. Stacia, Stacia Crick. People in victimhood came up with the term of empath. No, they did not. I just explained how the term empath came about. And the word victimhood, get off my channel. 
victims are allowed to be victims on my channel. Empath came out of a light worker, Luciferian agenda, period. Okay? It came out of, I've explained it so many goddamn times, Stacia, and I just explained it, and then you went against and tried to, you know, t you want to teach? Go teach your own stuff, girl. T I get tired with you people. You're draining. If you want to, you know, debate me, show me the proof. Show me the proof. One or two of the narcissists or psychopaths doesn't bother me, but when it becomes draining as fuck and repeating myself, it gets tiring. Let me grab another bottle of water. <coughs> Listen, you guys, when I block people left and right like that, you know, even if I make a mistake, I'm not going to feel bad about my decisions while I'm doing live streams, right? When I see a behavior that is aggressive or goes against something I teach here, I've learned independently to make these decisions to cut people off. In real life as well, like I said, I just, you know, broke up with a guy who was dating almost six months, so... Independent people, we make decisions and we follow through. We don't have remorse or guilt or feel bad about our decisions. It's very rare that, you know, if I cut somebody off, I mean, I highly doubt they're a healthy person. Um, it's not like I knee-jerk react. But years ago, when I was doing live streams, I'm certain I cut off people that, you know, maybe I shouldn't have. But um, I want you guys to learn that Making decisions and protecting your peace to remain independent becomes your, your livelihood. I mean, that's how healthy people work. We operate in the tense where somebody fucks you over and shows a pattern, even in an hour's live stream where like that Gemini flame showed a successive pattern over time. We have to make decisions. We don't regret the decisions. I'm not going to ruminate. Now, as a codependent, you will. But learning to become independent, you're going to learn to start trusting decisions. Even if a decision turns out to be the wrong decision. You don't, you don't get lost in it like a codependent does. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I make mistakes, man. I'm human. Other than justice, what other tarot card do you relate to? My birth cards, I run a tarot, tarot scope. They're called tarot scopes. Your tarot scope birth cards, everybody will have two major arcanums as their birth scope tarot cards. It's based on your birthday. Mine is the justice and the high priestess. They're both the pillars of truth. They stand for the law of Ma'at, uh, both cards. I have the whole succession. So each, each person will have Two distinct tarot birth cards. Maurice, clearly I'm not a bro. Bro. Yo, it's rude, bro. I love to do astrology readings. They're my favorite thing because when you guys get to hear your natal chart, you will be so relieved. You will go back to every single, well, not every single, but so many different situations in your life, whether it was family, sibling, neighbor, teacher, guidance counselor, some authority. You'll go around the whole wheel with me and you will be shocked. You will be so happy that I'm showing you your strengths where your abusers tried to make those strengths in you your weaknesses. You have been talked out of everything good about yourself. So when I get to do astrology readings on you guys that include those birth cards, those tarot cards, it is the most magnificent things because you guys swell up. Some of you cry in joy. Some of you are so happy to be validated for this person that they shamed you for. And it just proves to you that you are this specific 
person with these specific strengths and you can't deny it because they're right there in a chart like you can't they can't be denied it's almost like you wish you could take that natal chart and take it to your abuser and say see motherfucker i am what you made me try to think i was <laughs> fucking awesome I do, Dan, but I won't give my friends' names away publicly. I've made that mistake before as well. You're welcome. You're more than welcome to DM me and tell me what you're looking for, and I'll see if I can refer you to some of my badass friends and some of my esoteric motherfucker teachers. I teach tarot, but I have an eight-week course to do that, and I'm BOTA trained, B-O-T-A. Look it up. It's extensive. Stelliums are so interesting. I think I have one in either the 8th or ninth house. You probably do. It's probably 8th house Placidus and ninth house Whole. So, girl, stelliums are not for sissies, as a woman named Donna Cunningham. You know what, Dan? I want to go back to you. Dan, you should get a personal astrologer. Join somebody's group. Join somebody's app. Join somebody's Patreon. Come work with me. You know, start with with learning astrology or getting your daily reading or working with a badass learning your natal chart because once you learn it you'll start to know what to look for and then having a daily astrologer i pride myself on that every morning it's part of my morning routine i listen to a couple of my personal astrologers do college fraternities attract people with disordered personalities yes they do damn they do because it's a group think environment right they all think the same perfect dish du jour for the narcissist a lot of golden child narcissists are in the frats they're kind of like gym rats if they're not in the frats they're gym rats yeah good question for sure college frats attract the rats college sororities attract the oh i don't even know how to rhyme with that one the comorbidities. College fraternities attract the rats. College sororities attract the comorbidities. Sup, y'all. Doshans deep woo. Sup, y'all. Where are you from, Doshans deep woo? Where you at? D, where you at? Where you from? I only been here five minutes. You remind me of Duolo the Pilot Man, if you heard of him. No, I'm my own person. I shouldn't remind you of nobody. I'm an independent badass. Please, brothers and sisters, Boone. Boone, when you tell somebody we you remind us of somebody, a healthy person don't like that. You codependents will suck that shit up because when you codependents give us what you think is a compliment, you guys are so way off of who we are. The last person that came in, she was a borderline and she was like, oh my God, I'm so excited. The comments are open. I just have to tell you, you remind me so much of Rachel Maddow. Maddow or something, Maddox. And I was like, who the fuck is this? And I had to Google Rachel Maddow or Maddox, and I Googled her, and I was like, fuck. She's comparing me to some blonde-haired Hollywood actress that I have absolutely not one single goddamn thing in common. I don't even look like her. So when you guys tell me I remind you of somebody, you guys are so far the fuck off. So far the fuck off. And it's a turnoff. You guys are delusional. You live in this magical space where you think I remind you of Rachel Meadow or Rachel Maddox and whoever Dolo de Pilot Man is. That sounds fucking delusional to me. Get a life. Learn that people are independent. Got it, brother? It ain't no laughing matter. If you think my boundaries are a laughing matter, get the fuck off my channel. Bound my boundaries, my feelings, my interpretation of... What I just explained to you is not a laughing matter. Got it? Called respecting somebody for their boundaries as a healthy person after I just explained that you guys are far off base. Stop. It's not funny. 
By the way, codependent empathic people, you don't do shit like that. You don't laugh at people's feelings. Rachel Maddow is a brunette. She's a hard... I didn't ask you to describe who she is, girl. She's either Rachel Meadow, Rachel Maddox. I don't know. She was some blonde-haired Hollywood actress, and she was in some witchy movie. So, I'm not here for you to tell the room who Rachel Maddow is. You're clearly not following content. Bye. The ocean's deep woo. I do live in a magical space, but no idea who Rachel is. Well, deep ocean's woo, you came in and said, sup. So I asked, where are you from? You don't have to give me no exact location. Are you from the borough? Are you from the barrio? Are you from fucking streets? What does that mean? What's sup? I asked, where are you from? Somebody who says, sup. Don't live in no magical place. I guarantee somebody who says, sup. Lives in some pretty realistic, fucked up places where they're strong as fuck. Bye. Okay, brothers and sisters. Slew of waves of people. Lots of borderlines. Oh, brothers and sisters. All right. Any other questions? We've had some good questions in here tonight. We've had people wasting our time. You got to see the repeats of that. I'm so sorry. And then I sidetracked, getting our time wasted. I've been on quite a bit. I've been on 165 minutes. Am I single? Do you think you have the right to know that question? Answer to that question? Because people who are asking me that clearly aren't interested in anything about me other than knowing if I'm single. Bye, Felicia. That's for me to know, and I'll never tell you. Fuck off. Does the three option change if it's a mom and dad narcissist for the only child? Candace, no. I mean, you'll grow up abused, neglected. You'll grow up having to fulfill a role of representation. It's hard to say. What you're grown up as is a codependent. It doesn't matter, scapegoat. I have a video. I never remember the name of it. 23 signs you're a scapegoat. 23 ways to know if you're a scapegoat. Go check that out, girl. See if that helps you out. I don't think it's necessary for us to know, you know, did I grow up partially scapegoat and partially golden child? All you need to know is, hey, I grew up abused. I grew up neglected. I grew up being invalidated. I grew up being blamed. I grew up with these really weird expectations that if I wasn't a good little girl or performed a certain way, I wasn't going to get treated good. That's all you need to know. I was treated badly. I was, I was trained to be codependent. I don't want you guys to get stuck on diagnoses or labels. <coughs> I want you to get... I want you to understand what codependency is because, you know, the behavior that you're taught is that you're worthless and the re reflexes that you have behaviorally are toxic. And those behaviors that you have that are reflexes repel healthy people. And you guys deserve to have healthy people in your life who will care for you and be healthy but you have to become healthy. So I want you to look at codependency. The patterns of that behavior mirror narcissists. You might want to look at my set list, Candace. I have a whole set list designed for codependency of you beautiful love-starved empaths. Whether it's the way you know empaths use a playbook, whether it's the way empaths gaslight, whether it's the way empaths mistake their boundaries, whether it's the way empaths or not empath, sorry, I'm using the empath word. Sorry, that shit got me saying empath. Whether it's the codependent learning um, that they don't have good boundaries, the codependent learning that they have no value, so they over-talk, they people, please go check out the set list. You might learn a whole lot about codependency behavior, not empath behavior. Sorry about that, guys. 
I agree. I dislike the family dynamic psychology labels. Each member as. It's not that simple. And it can get you so confused too, Candace. Laura makes a good point. Agree. I dislike the family dynamic psychology. Psychology label. Each member as. It's not that simple. Right? So, like, even a golden child can grow up very golden child, but the moment they're out of the house or the moment, you know, they're off doing something, boy, the scapegoating happens after the golden child leaves, you know. Or the scapegoat, for instance, is so abused, neglected, punished, blamed, attacked, ignored, and then they go out in public and they're treated like a golden child because now they're in front of society. So we have to not be that simplified. Let's look at the codependency we were trained to exhibit toxic patterns of behavior. This message is held for review. I don't know what, why it's holding that for review. I don't know what F means, Claudia. Claudia just comes in the room and just writes one letter, F. That's all. Okay. Yeah, Candace, don't do that to your beautiful self. Hello. Can I ask you why my ex wants to keep getting back with me? What should I do? Well, you shouldn't have any contact with that ex, so he can't get back with you because you deserve better. What you should do is block, go no contact, hire a team of resources, and get well. Detox off the addiction that you're trauma bonded to an abuser that you pretty much want to come back and beg you. Sulks plays. I probably mentioned so many times in this video, and I know you probably haven't been here the whole time, but people who aren't asking questions like you, clearly, you don't want to go full no contact. You don't want to go through the detox of you know, pathological loneliness, and it's like a drug detox going no contact. What you should do is something you're not going to want to do. And you're going to fight, resist, and make excuses. You're coming to a perfect stranger's channel, getting advice, which is a no-no in itself. You need to hire a counselor, a case manager, a social worker, a coach like me. You need to get reality here. Stop asking strangers on YouTube. Okay? This is your life, right? Your life. But logically, you guys don't have logic. Codependents are trapped in learned helplessness, like this poor person is. Sulk's play is, right? He's, he or she's trapped in learned helplessness, coming to a stranger to say, what should I do? It's your life. I have no right to tell you. I have no right to tell you what to do with your life. We're not talking about Hollywood actors here, Cheryl. Clearly, clearly. You just disregarded and disrespected everything I said because Cheryl H. is coming in now wanting to talk about Rachel McAdams. Come on. Whether you really appreciate it or not, Cheryl, you're not welcome here. Get away from me. Go away. Don't come back. I hate disrespect. I want to know a muscles again. Show me an emoji, muscle or peace sign or just some kind of thumbs up. Have you ever just explained yourself to somebody? Really just explained yourself. Like I just did with the Rachel Maddow and that other guy, you know, saying I reminded him of some, I don't know, weird guy I don't even remember. And now the person comes in and just negates everything you just explained. Who's gone through that? where you really think you're expressing yourself. You're really thoroughly explaining yourself to someone. And after you're done explaining yourself, boy, they come right in and they just negate everything you said. How many people have gone through that thumb, thumbs up, point up, muscle? I'd love to know. There you go. AJ Brooks has a bunch of them. We're tired of that. We are fucking sick and tired of that. That's called boundary violations. That's called disrespect. That's called invalidation. That's called deflection. That's called abuse. That's called borderline, wants attention. Borderline doesn't care. That's called total disconnection. How many people? Yes, 
I used to do that once upon a time. Laura. Laura, I can't get into that. I promised myself I would not talk about my childhood upbringing. But the answer in just a nutshell, yes. And I'm not going to read your question live. If you don't mind, I'm going to hide the comment because I don't want to talk about that. But the answer is yes. Yes. The milk carton kids. Candace, yes. But I feel guilty for standing up for myself again, and I think I've explained myself wrong. It's good to see you doing it in real time. Candace, you know, honey, there's a great video that will benefit you called Your Rights Are Not Wrong. Codependents are trained to believe they don't have any right to speak up, to stand up, to exhibit a boundary, to stand the fuck up and, you know, call these people out. Because once you call them out, it feels like they're being humiliated. It's just that you're being logical. I happen to swear a lot, so I think that kind of gets confusing with people because I got a fucking gutter mouth. I don't when I'm in court or clearly when in a DA's office or anything, but on live, I swear a lot, clearly. So a lot of people have been through that, right? Where we just explained something so detailed. And then that person just rolls right over what you just said like they didn't even hear you. That's called abuse. It's also known as inversive gaslighting. Go check out yesterday's videos. I put out two of them on gaslighting. That is called inversive gaslighting, what that girl was doing about the actress. Yeah, inversive gaslighting. Thank you, girl, Laura. Thank you, honey. I really appreciate it. But the answer is yes. And I know some wonderful people who have done wonderful work. Some of them are very famous on the police circuit. So, yes, it's a great question. I, I can't talk about that. I made a promise. Thank you for respecting my promise. And thank you for asking such a good question. Yeah. You guys have been wonderful tonight. Does anybody have any more questions before I split out? I'm going to be back over the weekend. We'll do some tarot and astrology. Maybe we'll do another open Q&A, see how that goes. Wasn't too bad tonight. Thank you for letting me have these opportunities to teach in real time. And brothers and sisters, just know, I mean, I'm far from perfect. I want to show you what independence is like where you're not ashamed of who you are. You can get criticized and bullied and gaslit and, you know, word saladed and do all this inversive stuff and all of these attacks. And as an independent person, you're a flawed human. You're flawed. And being independent and healing from codependency is not that you're eradicating and erasing all narcissists from your life. It's that you have the capacity now to encounter narcissists that you will encounter through the rest of your life. Independence is also the ability to face chaos and fuckery and handle it stoically like a badass. Even when you're scared as fuck that you can say, I'm scared as fuck and I'm okay being scared as fuck. Independence is fabulous. Wait till you guys feel it. It feels wonderful. And when you come into it, it's called individuation, the third process. When it happens to you, you feel it. And once you become independent, you will never, ever be able to go back to codependency. In fact, when you have these little knee-jerk codependent kind of habits or behavior, you're so aware of it right away that you can become aware of it and correct it. And it's beautiful. And I hope every one of you get to experience it. Please go check out my I think it's like 16 minute video. What does traumatized to triumphant, broken to brilliant, rags to riches, and fearful to motherfucking fierce means? Because it means exactly what I'm trying to express to you guys. It is a feeling like you can't describe. And I mean, I was a wealthy motherfucking woman. I had tons of dollar dollars and it is priceless. There is no dollar tag that could put on the wealth and pricelessness that you will feel becoming independent and codependent no more. It is amazing and I wish it for all of you beautiful, beautiful people. Can you tell me what a narcissist will do when you start to put up your boundaries again? 
Okay, Leah. Listen, girl. Um, just real quick, I'm going to answer your question and then I'm going to head out. When you're in a relationship with, with a narcissist, I urge you do not do what these narc abuse coaches are telling you, including the beautiful Dr. Romani. They'll teach you to gray rock and, you know, have strong boundaries. And I'm going to tell you from a forensic point of view, from a profiler that rescues people and protects people and catches criminals, that is dangerous. If you're in a relationship with a narcissist um, in, in the house, boundaries are dangerous. Gray rocking is dangerous. I'm going to urge you get out of that house. If you're in a work environment, Leah, that's where boundaries will work with a narcissist. But they've got to be exhibited in a manner of which you guys have never been taught to talk. None of you codependents have been taught to talk. I'm still learning to talk like an independent person. So, if you're in the home with one, boundaries will get you DEAD and worse abused. If you're in a work situation, use them. I'm not going to say you might not lose your job. You probably will. And you're going to get a lot of coworkers, you know, talking behind your back at the water cooler. But don't use them at home, man. You got to play the game like you're some sorrowful, miserable, loser, worthless person until you can get out and escape. That's all I can tell you. I hope it helps you, Leah. If I can help any of you guys in any way, please come book your one-on-one. -on -one. All of my tyrant talking tactic classes are half price. They usually run 111 bucks. Come on, everybody, come get them for $65. dollars. It's your chance now to learn how to talk. And I got plenty of videos in my set list. I think even one called How to Talk to a Narcissist. I got narcissists taking narcissists to court. I got it all. If I can help you, come hit me up. You, Norm, Norma, I just explained to the other girl, what does boundaries do to a narcissist inside the house will be exactly what ignoring a narcissist in the house will do to them. It'll get you DEAD. It'll get you worse abuse. Stop listening to these coaches. Stop. In a co-worker environment, a job environment, fine. At home, don't do it. You got to pretend and play the role that you're, yes, a mess whatever you say, mess Okay, mess Please. Please. Okay, ladies. You deserve better. You deserve the truth. I'm not going to support these narc channels that are leading you down to a path of hell and a path of 30% of us are murdered. 85% of us attempt, commit, or are talked into S-U-I-C-I-D-E by using boundaries and ignoring them at home. Please, your life is at stake. You might not want to hear that you got to play victim. You got to play abused you got to be abused until you escape. None of you are going to like that. You'd rather hear from Dr. Romani or Narky Narc coaches. Oh, just use Ray Rock. Just ignore them. Use the silent treatment against them. I want to keep you guys alive. I want to keep you alive. I don't want you to be the 30% murdered or the 85% talked into taking your life. You deserve better. If I can help you, one-on-one -on -one IG, all my stuff will be in the description box. You guys deserve better. I know truth is a hard pill to swallow sometimes, brothers and sisters, but once you start taking the pills, it ain't hard to swallow anymore. And you're going to welcome the medicine because the medicine heals. The medicine is called truth. The medicine is called facts. And it's about time somebody tell you the truth and give you the facts that will help you, not hinder you. All right, brothers and sisters, you go have yourself a beautiful, kick-ass, spiritual motherfucking badass you. Go lavish yourself with pampering. Go eat some yummy chocolate cake. Go sit in bed and watch some silly comedy with your little puppy or your kitty cat. And just go nurture your beautiful, spiritual, badass, lovable self. All right? Come visit me over the weekend. And if you can't, 
come visit me on Mondays for your Monday lesson. I love you all. I believe in you all. You will become independent. I know you can do it. All right, Hulk smash, if you will. Subscribe, share my work. See you over the weekend.